Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's my pleasure to have you all join us this morning. And thank you so very much for your patience as we worked out our technical difficulties today. I'm Donna Jacobs, Senior Vice President for Government and Regulatory Affairs and Community Health at the University of Maryland Medical System. We're talking today about COVID-19 and mental health, particularly the feelings that COVID-19 generates. We're talking about how we handle it. And to some degree, I dare say that every one of us is experiencing COVID fatigue, undue stress, angst, anxiety, and perhaps unprecedented fear. As the COVID-19 pandemic drags on, you may find yourself in the mix of all of these feelings, and you may find that over time your feelings have begun to evolve to something else, and it may feel like grief or loss. It's certain that most of us are feeling we have simply had enough, yet the COVID reality persists, and the news continues to fluctuate. On Monday, we heard some great news about the possibility of a vaccine with 90% effectiveness and we all cheered. And then a day later here in Maryland, we learned that we've tipped the scale and we're back in the danger zone with the number of cases rising and hospitalizations rising rapidly. And we are left to wonder, how long will this go on? How much more can we take? We might also wonder, am I the only one feeling this way? Our community conversation today gives us an opportunity to speak with and hear from experts who can relate to what we're feeling and provide guidance about what we should do to stay well mentally and emotionally. Many of you have joined us before for our communications and our conversations in Not All Wounds Are Visible. Today's series, although virtual as they've been since April, is a bit different than our prior community conversations this year. Let's go to the next slide. This conversation today is more detailed and it is divided into two parts. As you can see on this agenda in the morning segment, we'll talk about understanding the feelings that you may now be experiencing and including grief and loss. After a short break for lunch, we'll talk about building your wellness toolkit and what you can do to stay well. You will have opportunities along the way to participate and to ask questions. You may at any time type a question in the Q&A, the question and answer box, and our presenters will be happy to address as many as time allows. The slides that will be shared today will be online in about 48 hours, so you don't need to scribble uh, furiously as we go along. We will make them available to you. And as the morning uh, progresses, we'll share the link in the Q&A box for you, and we'll give it again at the end. Here to start our conversation and to provide some perspective on the pandemic is Dr. Charles Callahan. He's the Vice President of Population Health at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Dr. Callahan has 30 years of experience in pediatrics, pulmonary, and intensive care. He's a retired Army physician executive with global experience including caring for Ebola patients in Sierra Leone. Those experiences have proven invaluable to the state of Maryland during this COVID crisis. Dr. Callahan is almost singularly responsible for establishing the massive COVID testing operations at the Baltimore Convention Center. And he was key in standing up the field hospital um, at the Convention Center, as well as the isolation operations at the Lord Baltimore Hotel. Next slide. Dr. Uh, Deborah Weber and Kent Alford together will present following Dr. Callahan. Ms. Weber is a master certified licensed clinical professional counselor and the manager of the University of Maryland Shore Regional Health Behavioral Health Intensive Outpatient Program in Dorchester, Maryland a role she has held for over 20 years. She conducts daily intensive mental health 
therapy. And as well, she has a private practice in which she counsels individuals, couples, and provides family therapy and grief counseling. Kent Alford is a board-certified psychiatric registered nurse and behavioral health director at the University of Maryland Capital Region Health in Prince George's County. He, too, has over 20 years of experience as a behavioral health clinician. He's the co-chair of the Behavioral Health Advisory Group, and he serves on several community mental health committees, and he has piloted many state-of-the-art programs in behavioral health in Maryland, including telepsychiatry. Also joining us for this segment are Wanda Binns, on the next slide, and Connie Knoll on the next slide. I will introduce them more formally after lunch, but want to, you to be aware that they are on the line this morning with us should they decide to chime in on the conversation. Just a couple of things. Next slide. Some of this conversation may trigger sensitive information for you. That certainly is not our intent, and we are not here to uh, make anyone uncomfortable. But should you find yourself in that position or feeling anxious, feel free to just a walk away from the screen for a bit and rejoin us when you like. Next slide. And let me also say that this presentation will provide general wellness information and tips, and it's not intended as a substitute for medical advice. Please, if you feel you need that, contact your provider for specific information, guidance, and recommendations. And there are always additional resources available to you at ums.org slash coronavirus. And with those um, uh, preliminary comments, let us get started. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Callahan. And again, remember, if you'd like to use the Q&A box for any questions, please feel free to do that. Dr. Callahan. Good morning. Next slide, please. What a privilege, first off, let me say what a privilege it is for me to be able to join you today. Um, I wanted to start uh, by putting this past year in a little bit of context. Uh, we talk a lot about COVID now as though it's something we've known about for a long time, but I'd like to highlight as you look at this slide, 311. There's a lot of uh, dates on here and events, but January 11th of 2020, just uh, 10 months ago, was when the first reported death from coronavirus happened and was a 61-year-old man in Wuhan province in China. Go a month later to February 11th, 2020, and that was when the disease was named for the first time. That was uh, nine months ago when it was first called COVID-19, a name that will now characterize uh, the year 2020 in, in, with many other things about this year. And then fast forward another month to March 11th, that's when the COVID-19 uh, epidemic was declared a global pandemic. And so you see, that's only eight months ago. So a lot of what we've experienced about this, this disease and this process, which now is a, a global, uh, obviously a global threat, uh, has really happened in the last eight months. That is not a lot of time to process a lot of what has happened uh, to us over this last uh, very short period of time. And as we talk today, I think it's important to remember in context that this is not something we've had years or decades to get used to. Next slide, please. I'll do just a couple of graphs uh, to show a little bit about what's happening. This is a wonderful site that both comes from Hopkins and from uh, the, the coronavirus, Maryland.gov, for more information. Uh, that is the number of cases in Maryland over the past, uh, of the, since the pandemic began. You can see the top curve uh, shows the spikes we've had in, in numbers of cases by day. Uh, and then you can see, uh, very, uh, very importantly to us right now, those of us that are in, in this work every day, that the, the, the numbers of cases are rising again. And what that means, and we'll come to this at the end, is more, case, more individuals being touched by this disease directly and indirectly to say nothing of the changes in our lifestyle. In the bottom left, you can see that hospitalizations are rising. The dark line is total hospital beds. The, uh, the uh, pink one is acute beds. And the, the, the purple one at the bottom is uh, intensive care beds. The numbers of hospitalizations are also rising. And what follows hospitalizations by about 14 days are actually 
um, deaths from COVID. And I don't have a graph of that, but that is something obviously that we'll be looking at as well. The bottom right graph talks about something we really never really even considered, those of us that don't do this every day, before the pandemic started, and that is this notion of a, of a test positivity. What percentage of the tests that we do are positive? The blue lines are the number of tests that were done per day. Uh, this is a, 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 the, the local numbers. And you can see that the, the test positivity rate uh, peaked in the mid to high 20s when we were first getting good at that. And that, that meant that the only people getting tests back then were people who clearly had symptoms and were pretty sick with the disease. The idea of testing is to find everybody that has the disease, separate quarantine, uh, and allow them to recover, but not to infect other people. And we've been relatively successful to that as a state, but you can see that the test positivity rate is also beginning to climb again. And that just means that there's a greater burden of disease in the population. Next slide, please. Another set of data, and we won't spend a lot of time on this, uh, but I do think uh, I have a good friend uh, who runs a nonprofit in the city who says it's ob our obligation is to call a thing a thing. Well, here's one of the things. Um, there's no question that coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, has, has disproportionately affected the communities of color uh, in our state. You can see the percentages in the black numbers, uh, the representation of these three, these four racial groups uh, and uh, uh, ethnic groups in our state. And you can see next to it the bar graphs that show the prevalence of the numbers of cases and deaths by those groups. And, and what this tells us is that people of color have been disproportionately affected by this. And the right-hand graph reminds us that deaths tend to occur from this disease in, in the older population, people closer to my age group uh, and up from that. But what we'll learn today is it has had a monumental impact at every life, at every age, and at every life stage. And that's part of what we'll be talking about today. Next slide, please. I just wanted to spend a moment because in this vestige of calling a thing a thing or being honest about things, this testing volume and the test positivity uh, and its significance is worth mentioning because unlike a lot of diseases, for example, in the Spanish flu, we talk today about the flu of the early part of the last century and we, we talk about 25 million cases across the globe. Those cases were not diagnosed by a flu test. In fact, the scientists at the time debated whether or not they were even dealing with a single disease because the way it appeared in different age groups and different populations was so different, many scientists believed it was a different disease. We know now, looking back, exactly what strain of flu it was. But I think it's important to remember that not a single person who had flu at the beginning part of the last century had a flu test done. Viruses really hadn't been well understood yet, and there were no tests. So when we define COVID and we talk about tests positive, this is a new way in, in that regard to talk about this pandemic relative to the last great pandemic that we all talk about in 1918. And that means you have to have access to a test. You have to trust the people doing the test in order to get the test. And that has made additional complications for the different populations and individuals that might be on this call today, but also the populations that we serve uh, as a medical system. Next slide, please. And this just an go ahead, thank you. And so uh, this gets to the fact that when you look at hospitalizations or cases or deaths, as I said before, populations of color are disproportionately impacted by that. As you see cases are higher among uh, American Indian and Alaskan Natives. They're higher among Black, black uh, African Americans and higher among uh, the Hispanics, uh, Hispanic or Latinx community. You can see also that hospitalizations are disproportionately affecting populations of color, uh, and as well death in particular for Black or African American, uh, disproportionate. And this speaks to the burden of this on the families and the communities that we have the privilege of serving. Next slide, please. So the way this plays out, and we'll go through these very quickly, is several steps that go into the impact of this disease. And the first up there is the possibility of being exposed to the disease. We are all per perhaps know that the state has developed a, 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 an app that will tell you 
if you've been near somebody. And I, I got that email on my phone last night, and I thought it's additional level of stress that I'm going to be told that I might have come in contact with somebody. It's an important public health tool, but it's another thing that we have to talk about. Those who work in service industries are more likely to be exposed. And that's the first thing we talk about, disproportionate to the populations of color. Prevention, it means I can live, I can isolate myself, I can afford to take time off of work, I can be by myself, and the prevention becomes something also that is easier for someone like me than individuals of a population of, uh, of color. Next slide. We already saw that cases disproportionately affect individuals uh, and, and communities of color. So whether or not I get infected the disease because I can't isolate or I've got a heavy burden of the disease is also one of the, one of the pressures that we carry. Next slide. And then obviously, whether or not I'll even know I have the disease. Do I have access to a test? At the convention center, we, uh, with the team, we've tested more than 40,000 people with, with uh, COVID-19 uh, COVID symptoms since June. And disproportionately in the city of Baltimore, 57% uh, of them are, are white or European American, and only 24% uh, of the people we tested were black or African American. And so disproportionately people accessing the largest site in the city for any number of reasons, public transportation, having a car and so forth, feeling comfortable going down there. So testing is not playing itself out equally, adding additional stress. New slide, next slide. Then the question is accessing health care and all that goes into to feeling comfortable accessing health care. Do I wait longer to go to the emergency room? Do I wait longer to go to the hospital? Could it have made a difference if I go earlier, I get treated earlier? Certainly, these will be increasingly important to us as we introduce in the next days and weeks the next drug that's available. Maybe you saw the headlines about the monoclonal antibody. Who will have access to that and when and how will I have access to that? An additional, uh, additional burden or stress on all of us. And finally, last slide or last line here. Go ahead. And then, of course, we've already shown uh, that mortality from COVID-19 is affected certainly by age, but we believe also by the burden of chronic disease, which, as I say, disproportionately affects communities of color. Next slide. And so we know across the United States today, 3% of Americans have tested positive for COVID. Next. 11% are pretty sure they've had COVID-19, so that's 14%. There's probably a significant number of folks who, who may have had it and don't know they have it, but two-thirds of Americans today know someone who's had COVID-19. And that means the reality of this virus that we've only known about for 10 months or nine months has affected at this point two-thirds of the population, probably more than half of everyone on this call today. And so carrying those burdens around with us uh, in addition to all of the other stressors that have come with 2020 are really what we're going to be addressing and speaking to today. Next slide. Dr. Callahan, thank you so much for that uh, foundational information. And you've given us the perfect segue to move into this next uh, segment, which is all about naming, taming, and reframing uh, your grief and the feelings that we've been experiencing. And we're going to start now with uh, Ms. Weber. Thank you, Dr. Callahan. Good morning. Next slide, please. In order to name, tame, and reframe our grief of whatever nature is our grief, we have to understand, begin to understand COVID fatigue. And so it's important that we do become and remain informed. However, there are some of us who find that we need to have more information. And in fact, I've had some patients who report that they have the news on in their house 24 hours a day. And so they're, they are becoming and remaining informed, but they are absorbing far too much information. And some of it is repetitive. And that contributes to the fear factor, a fear factor of is this all that life is about now? Is this all that, that I can, can focus my attention to? And that brings up other questions such as how much longer will this last? And what will life be like in a post-COVID world? 
And will I ever be able to fully relax? So all of these, these things are contributing to COVID fatigue, but there's more. And so to, again, name, tame, and reframe, we need to acknowledge and <laughs> grieve what has been lost, including 230,000 plus lives, and that number goes up every day. When I prepared this slide, it was about that number, and I'm sure there, it's a little higher now. We've lost the ability to move about freely, and, and I'm going to focus more on these issues as we go along and presenting an overview now. It has an impact on uh, employment and economic security. It has a very dramatic impact on our routines, and I'd like to say a little about that later, about the importance of having a routine. We may have lost some tradition, personal freedom, but most important, emotional ease. Next slide, please. So interspersed with my presentation, we'll be having an opportunity for our audience to, to submit some questions. And so what is the biggest loss you are currently experiencing as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? And for the sake of keeping on time, we're going to allow you to type in those questions while I continue with my slides, and we will answer them as, as they appear. Next slide, please. We'll begin with loss. And remember, we're talking about a series of losses or a variety of losses. For instance, the loss of life of strangers. And that may seem sort of remote from us. And, and when we see it on television and, and hear about it, and sometimes folks who have lost loved ones are interviewed or people who are very sick are interviewed. And that does have an impact on all of us. But then the impact becomes much greater when we lose someone we love, a parent, a spouse, a, a sibling, a child, coworkers. There's also the loss of freedom. And in the loss of freedom, it's moving about without fear. So there's two losses, loss of ability to move around very much. But even when we do leave our homes and, and move around, many of us experience fear. We've lost the, the, the freedom of feeling unencumbered. When we go out, we, have, we should. I hope all of you, my listening audience, are, are wearing masks when you go out and that you're maintaining social distance. Um, but that's a bit of being encumbered, isn't it? Even, even when we pump gas, I see, and I do this, we wear gloves if we can. So again, feeling a bit encumbered. And we've lost the confidence in feeling safe in the company of others, and to me, that's one of the most important losses of all. If, if we're used to being with friends, coworkers, family, um, church members, um, even going to the movies, loss of feeling safe in the company of strangers, those things are gone now to some extent, more for some than for others. Next slide, please. And, and Deborah, if I can just jump in here. Um, when I think of this slide, particularly confidence and feeling safe in the company of others and feeling unencumbered, mm -hmm. um, I used to be a hugger, right? Um, hugging was a natural thing for people that I was had affinity to and handshaking. Um, gone are the days where I don't think I've seen a hug in nine months. And mm -hmm. definitely handshaking uh, is no longer is prohibited. At best, you may get a ankle, uh, an elbow up. Uh, or, or a wave, and, and that's a, a loss of the intimacy of your friends and then having the ability to express that, um, that is no longer available, and that's a loss that many of us um, have experienced. Let Very me true. also jump in and say um, for our listeners, if you would like to go ahead and uh, jump in and share the kind of loss that you've been experiencing, go ahead and put that in the chat, in the Q&A box, and we'll address those as we go along, as we see them pop up. We had intended to have a polling question, uh, a polling capability, but it isn't working, but we do want your input here. I just want to add something, too, based on what Kent just said. It's an excellent point. I run a grief group, and that's one of the things that we're talking about is our inability to really be there to support friends and family during their time of loss. 
and you as a church member you go to church and you're there we had a funeral last week and i wanted so much to hug my 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 member because she lost her husband but i couldn't do it because i didn't want to jeopardize her well-being and as ken said i am a hugger so that's a loss for me but it's also a loss for the clients that we work with and our family and friends so that's an excellent point thank you thank you i'll have the next slide please How about loss of routine? And, and this is an extremely important thing. The, the concept of routine is what provides some protection for us from everyday stress. And now even these routines are disrupted. For instance, missing school. Some of us have to miss work, missing church. We just spoke quite a bit about missing interaction. How about this one, missing time alone? If you are at home with others, um, family members, children, and, and you're used to having at least a few minutes or maybe hours a day to be by yourself, that routine may have been disrupted. And then missing recreation or fun activities. And that loss of routine um, can have an impact on our ability to, to have a good appetite or get restorative sleep at night. Um, those are things, again, that provide protection from stress, insulation from stress. But now we are, we are missing those things. And, and, and Deborah, just to add to that, um, the, the missing school bullet point, um, I have a number of my employees who are, are parents um, of, of young children. And the fact that those first and second and third graders can't go to school, that's an important um, meter for them for social interaction. And that's a significant loss and one that we'll see the impact of for many years. So it definitely is hitting home in many domains. Very true. And for some parents whose children aren't, can't go to school now, they've had to, to give up jobs because they can't find adequate daycare. They don't feel safe leaving their children in daycare. And so they're home with their children and trying to, to help them do the schoolwork. And I can't tell you how many of my, my patients Say they're highly frustrated because they don't understand the schoolwork themselves and it's hard to learn in a remote format. And so, so again, this is loss upon loss or stress upon stress. Let let me just, let me, I'm sorry, let me just note that several people have written in that they're missing time with family and grandchildren in particular, and others have said, I definitely, they're signifying what Kent said, I definitely miss the hugs and having friends and family over regularly. So we're hearing that from people. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, but I'm sure that's one of the greatest loss, losses so far that we've, we've seen, um, aside from loss of life. And loss of financial security is extremely important as well because that can disrupt routine. For instance, financial difficulties. If you, if you can't work, you don't have the money to pay your rent or your mortgage or your utilities, we're coming into the cooler months now, and some people can't afford to have their oil drum filled, or they can't afford to pay their electric bill. Loss of employment income, and I kind of touched on that, but loss of employment income is important, but loss of employment um, is a loss also of that interaction we were just mentioning about five weeks back, that if you're used to having colleagues, or used to having coworkers, um, that's a double loss, the income and the um, affinity you have with others. I'm of a certain age, and some people on this panel are, that my retirement income now is being impacted. Because I'm an essential worker, I, I have to work. I show up for work every day, so I'm still making money, but some of my retirement income is being lost that, that is invested. Loss of home and Again, I'm going to refer back to many of my patients who now are worried that they've either lost their home or in the process of being foreclosed or evicted. And where I live on the Eastern Shore, we don't have very many homeless shelters. We're coming into the cool months. So we're going to see an uptick in, potential uptick in homeless individuals. And that is a loss of security that is unique. You know, it's one thing to have to face financial difficulties when you have a place to sit or to lie down and like to sleep. But if you don't, then that's more difficult. And then after all of those things, the loss of prospects. 
So what, where can I go? What can I do? What job can I do that I can stay home and be safe and take care of my family? And if, if employers are not hiring now because they can't afford to hire people, then again, loss of prospective employment. And, and Deborah, just to add to that, um, I've had many of, of, of some patients and even some friends um, who were successful business owners. Um, and, and I guess with the COVID endemic, um, they lost their business. And the loss was per pervasive across the whole domain of, of social life. I mean, just not losing the business itself, it was a, maybe a business that had been in the family for 60, 70 years. Mm -hmm. but the impact of that, then the loss of in income because of it and, and, the, and the recovery, uh, many of them uh, are having difficulty adjusting. So that's something I've seen a trend here in this, um, in this area as well. That, that's true. And here on the Eastern Shore where I'm located, many businesses are owned by individuals or families and have been the family business for a long time. And it is difficult for, for us in this community to see those businesses close. And I, I have to worry and wonder about the families who have had the same business for generations. So, you know, the, the losses are still, while they're still occurring, it's hard to see what the accumulative effect will be as we go forward. This next one, this loss of opportunity. Now, I don't know about you, but going to the grocery store was an event for me. I, I was one of those people that I kind of liked going to the grocery store and seeing people and seeing what's new on the shelves. Now, it's, it's difficult to go to the grocery store. And when we do get there, there may be empty shelves. And so I'm, I'm kind of bringing this out, and it seems like it's a lot of gloom and doom, but I'm bringing it out because it will speak to the next part of my, my talk about when we, we have to deal with losses and how do we grieve such losses or potential losses. Mm -hmm. Food insecurity. Oh, did you have a comment, Ken? You know, I, I was thinking through this, and um, I'm fearful every time I go into a grocery store, um, toilet paper and water mm -hmm. was gone for weeks and weeks. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I didn't store up on it like, like some people did. So that was definitely a cause of anxiety. So now I always monitor that carefully and listen carefully to the news because I lost the ability to, to think I can walk in a store and mm -hmm. get those kind of basic things that may not exist. So definitely the reality is hit home. It has. And so not say, go ahead. I'm sorry. One thing. For the elders, what you described about going to the grocery store being in a, an event for you, I have heard so many people, uh, you know, elderly, say mm -hmm. that was the only thing that I looked forward to all week, and that was what got me out of the house, and I'm really missing that. Yes, and it's sad. In some communities, they're designating a certain day of the week or certain hours of the day where they encourage seniors to come in. They won't keep others out. but. To, to give seniors a sense of safety that they can go in without having other people or too many other people in the store. But then they lose the sense of the marketplace. And that's what the Walmarts of the world, the grocery stores of the world, that these are our open air marketplaces with a roof. And so that's a part of society that's extremely important. On the speak of food insecurity, we, we know, because all of us are in, in this business, and I'm sure some of our listeners are aware, and they may be, themselves suffering from food insecurity. And that just means that you're not sure where your next meal will come from. That perhaps you're used to having a pantry that's lined with canned goods and, and box goods, and that supply perhaps may be dwindling. And so it's important, again, to, to acknowledge these things as we move forward. And finally, a loss of discretionary spending. And we're coming up on the, the holiday season where people tend to spend more on meals and, and if they exchange gifts, they, they spend more on that. And because of fear of what, what might happen in December and January and beyond, many people are saying, I, I really don't think I can engage in that type of thing this year. Even the Salvation Army has, has talked about they might not have enough people. They, they want more people to come out and ring the bell. How about a, a loss of ability to engage in traditions, such as weddings and funerals? Those are such important events. They're sentinel events. And it's difficult to attend them with ease now out of fear. Birth. A colleague of mine is um, expecting a baby. His wife is due in January. And the hospital where she'll be delivering has already told him 
it depends on what's happening. He may not be able to be in the in the room or in the maternity ward at the time of, of the birth, and he's very dismayed. So even before the event, he's having sleepless nights worrying about this. Many of you probably had um, young people who were graduating, or not so young, lots of people middle-aged and older are going to college, but graduations had to be put on hold this year. I had a couple of nieces and nephews who were graduating. Um, and new college experiences, where now many students are attending remotely instead of that surge of excitement about going and meeting your roommates and moving into a dorm. The holidays, what will the holidays be like? Well, I know what Fourth of July was like, the canceled fireworks in my community. Um, and there are a lot of, of admonishments about getting together for Thanksgiving. So, so again, the traditions are the things that kind of hold us together, and some of those are being, um, we're being warned not to engage. Social gatherings, such as at church, um, we have a, a lunchroom here where I work at Dorchester Hospital, and they have rules now, there can't be more than five people in the lunchroom at a time. Well, so people are eating at their desks by themselves. So even that half hour of social gathering, which meant a lot to many of us, particularly those who live alone, at least they got to interact with their coworkers, and they're, they're going dates. Lots of people are going on virtual dates. They 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 don't want to go out in public. They don't want to. So so if you understand Zoom or or any of the other um, virtual methods, and then finally sporting events. And as we're going back into some of that, we're finding that teams are are having issues with their players becoming infected with COVID. Um, and they can't have these people in the stands that they once did the fans in the stands. And, and, and Deborah, go ahead. I'm sorry. If just uh, um, one thing to add, the one when I look at these bullet points, the one unifying thing that everyone did to to make these events happen was flying, airplane travel. Yeah. Um, and the industry, airplane industry, has been depressed in in ways that we've never seen before. And I, I mean, personally, I haven't flown since February and, and flying for me, summertime was, was a fun thing, you know, going, but people don't do it because of the fear and the loss and the anxiety because of that. And that's been a huge thing. And then cruises as well. A lot yeah. of my friends are, cru uh, I call them yearly cruisers. Uh, but that now has, I've taken a backseat to this. And that's another loss for many people. It is the ability to get away, if you would. May I say something? Yeah. Um, the other slide, I, my six-year-old grandson called me yesterday and he said, Grandma, the virus is going to end so I can come to your house and Grandpa's house, if only. But the thing that really stood out for me is that he's six years old and he recognized that he hasn't been able to come to Grandma and Grandpa's house for a while because of the virus. And as adults, we know the struggle that we're having. What about the impact for the children? And again, with um, someone, you, I think you were talking about the significance of um, school-age children, second, third, and fourth grade. That is such a critical time for them to engage with other children. And when that doesn't happen, imagine what that's, what that's doing to them emotionally and psychologically. Mm -hmm. Kate was just talking about travel. I've never had so much vacation time in my life built up because I can't go anywhere. And it truly affects me because I love the fall. It doesn't love me. And usually what I would do is I'd go to the island of Florida. Well, I can't do that. So you try to find other ways to engage to kind of pick up your spirits. So again, these are losses that we all can experience with regard to our individual family members as well as with our clients. Absolutely. I, I appreciate you bringing out the, the part about children, especially um, those in early elementary education. Mm -hmm. Because not only is it the, the ABCs and one, two, threes, this is a developmental stage where little human beings learn how to react and be interact with other little human beings, and it prepares them for middle school. It prepares them for high school. And, and I do have to wonder if this goes on a lot longer. I hope that it won't with an inoculation and around the corner. I'm sorry. I just want to add one thing. You know, uh, one, and I'll talk about this in the slide upcoming. We are seeing a, a pretty depressing trend. A lot of our minors and adolescents 
are now showing up in the emergency room for psychiatric treatment. No. Um, we, we average about maybe four a day in our system, sometimes six. And at any given time, it's because of a number of things that we just mentioned. And mm -hmm. that developmental milestones that they have to achieve, if they're not meet, making those and other issues, then we, we see them as um, in our emergency room and they stay until they find the appropriate, appropriate treatment provider. So that's, that's pretty depressing. It's, it's depressing and very distressing when you consider the long-term impact. If a child, a small child, in fact, has to go to the hospital and then ultimately may require hospitalization or a referral to mental health treatment, um, while those things are necessary and helpful, it sort of sets a precedent in some cases. So, so, and, and so those are very cogent losses. I think someone else had a comment. No? Okay. Okay. Um, and so, so the loss of emotional ease, that question, what if, what if it gets worse? What if the inoculation doesn't work? What if, and you know, if adults are feeling that way, I'm going to loop back around and pick up children. What if, and if you think that, if you live with children and you think that they don't pick up on your stress, I'm, I've got to tell you, they do. And if you if you do have a, a news outlet that's running 24 hours a day in your home, they are picking up on that as well. And and so it's repetitive. So what if? And if only, if only I could have been with my loved one when he or she was in the hospital. If only I could have avoided interacting with someone on on the bus who sat next to me. I, I would not have gotten this illness. So there's lots of what ifs and if onlys, and those types of triggers can promote a great deal of stress and remove our emotional ease. Everywhere we go, does my colleague have it? Does my neighbor have it? Does my dog groomer have it? Anybody I come in contact with, because if you're asymptomatic, you could have it and you could be spreading it, but you might not look like you have it. It, it creates a, a fear that prevents some people from feeling that ease we used to feel. Do I have it? Now, I know, I want you to think about this I, for myself, in fact. If I wake up in the morning and I have a slight cough and a headache, I'm thinking, oh no, do I have it? Is it here? Is, it, is this it? And if I feel tired at the end of the day, and where I work, we're, we're required to take our temperature twice a day and record it. I work in a hospital. And if it goes up even slightly, I'm thinking, oh, no, I can't wait for 12 hours to take it again to see if there's something. That takes away that emotional ease that, that I once felt, that many of us felt, that we could go through our days with a feeling of that everything is fine, I'm fine, I'm going to be fine. This next it's question. It's oh, go ahead, Kent. But, Deborah, I, I want to say it, I, I call it um, hypersensitivity. Mm -hmm. uh, syndrome. I don't know if that's a scientific term to, to call it, but um, I'm hypersensitive to any part of my body that <laughs> I feel might be um, in some way bad. And, and and I have seasonal allergies, but mm -hmm. every day my allergies became an exercise of, oh boy, is this an allergy or is this something else? And and that hypersensitivity can cause a lot of people cause them, uh, extreme anxiety. So it's good to be have some awareness of that. It is, and, and actually, it shouldn't be ignored. Kent brings up a good point. Um, I, too, have seasonal allergies, and quite a few people do. Um, but if, if we're worried so much that even a sneeze or a cough or a runny nose is, is, is COVID, it, it just, again, it reduces our ease. And so, so yes, I, you're, you're correct. And I think that this is promoting many people who didn't used to think about such symptoms or their, their bodily um, sensations to be more on guard about that. And is that a good thing? Probably. But if it's taking away your ability to, to live with some ease, then it's not such a, a positive thing. This next, and, and go ahead. I just wanted to add something here because I just wanted to introduce the idea that there's a whole other dimension to what you're talking about because there are people who are going to be more vulnerable, and those are people who have physical illness and conditions, yeah. who have mental illness, 
who are going through developmental or life crises, such as separation and divorce, um, other kinds of things, and people who have alcohol and substance abuse problems. So in addition to having these vulnerabilities, there are people who are going to have perhaps a harder time dealing with all of this because of those underlying things. Absolutely. And and this also brings out, again, I, I mentioned previously, but I think it bears, again, the homeless population that, that have to be outside more in this cold weather. And I worry a lot. In my small community, it's easy to tell where the homeless are. They, they sort of huddle together, and it's, it's sad to see that. So it, it, it has an impact on all strata of society. And so, good point. I appreciate you bringing that out. Deborah, as, you're speak, as you all are speaking, I'm watching the comments that are coming in in the Q&A, and folks, keep them coming. Um, as you speak about the loss of emotional ease, there is a comment here from someone that says, and I am having concern and loss of ease because of some people not believing that this virus is real. And for me, that adds an extra stressor. And yes, that, that is significant. And I'm so surprised that maybe I'm surprised because I work in healthcare that I can't ignore it. But you're correct. There are some people who think that it's made up. It's fake news. It's, it's not real. And those of us who believe it, that somehow there's something inherently wrong with us because we, we choose to wear the mask. We think it's important to, to have social distancing. But you are correct. That, that certainly does add to um, the stress for for many of us, and and so I don't know what it's going to take. Actually, how much more evidence there has to be before people will begin to take it seriously. And and that leads into this next question: What will happen to my family if you know this is a disease that will have an impact on believers and non-believers? You know, those who say it's not real are just as susceptible as those of us who who are taking it seriously. What will happen to my family if I can't work, I can't bring an income? What will happen to my family if I have to be hospitalized and I'm the only adult in the house who would take care of my children? What will happen if I am very sick and I can't take care of disabled parents? Some of the patients I treat have dementia and they, they very much are dependent on their adult children or other family members. So that, that speaks to that what if again, what will happen if this next question is sort of an existential question. Why now? Well, I guess my response would be why not now? It's, it's one of those things that it could happen at any time. And even when this epidemic is finally under control, we would be foolish to think that it couldn't happen again because it just happened. So this is not to, to upset folks or to, to put them even at more emotional disease. It's to help us to say, help, help for me to say that we need, if we can, to live our lives as fully as possible, but not to be foolish or foolhardy about nutrition and getting adequate rest and, and making sure that we get inoculations, making sure that we're informed if something is um, around the corner. And why me? That's... That is another existential question. Why me? Um, that's hard, hard to say um, because this illness does have a disproportionate impact on certain individuals, certain ages, certain um, folks who have pre-existing conditions. But it also sometimes has a negative impact on seemingly perfectly healthy people. So again, we can't take it for granted that it won't be me. And so all of those things contribute to our emotional uh, dis-ease or ill at ease. Next slide, please. So, go ahead, Ken. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk a little about this, the loss of um, relationships. Um, because as we already mentioned, the anchor for many people um, to uh, as an anti-anxiety uh, strategy is family and relationships. If you look at the first bullet point, a loss of child or spouse, uh, grandparents, um, inability to see their, I think Wanda mentioned that earlier, 
um, inability to um, have access to a grandchild, um, a spouse that may be a healthcare professional. There may be that person has to uh, go on the second floor and do the work that they need to do because they may be working in an environment um, related to COVID. And so that loss of freedom to be able to access family members uh, definitely has taken its toll. Um, then, then there's some people, um, again, strong sense of failure. There are people who have guilt um, if they uh, have COVID or, or guilt if they, you know, didn't protect the family member against it, and there's a strong sense of failure. But the third bullet point um, is one that, that's interesting because I'm seeing this trend in um, hospitalizations. 67% increase in risk for psychiatric hospitalization in parents who have lost a child. So people who already had a loss before this, it now exacerbates. I think, Connie, you mentioned that this new, underneath this other layer of loss we have, the other losses that we, we have experienced um, come to surface. And we're finding that people now have multiple losses coming in for um, mental health and psychiatric support. The last bullet point, increased incidence of domestic violence. So I did get data related to this bullet point. Um, and so I'll give the numbers here. In Prince George's County, our crisis response team um, used to respond to perhaps maybe 80 calls, um, 60 to 40, 80, 40 to 60 calls a month. We now respond to 150 calls a month wow. versus the 40 to 50. We're at 150. This crisis team is seeing um, domestic violence like they've never seen it before. Um, it's not just spouse to spouse, it's children to parent, parent to child, relative to friend. It is an amazing amount of domestic violence um, we're seeing occurring. And our county is only representative of the nation at large. So you can imagine what this county sees, what it's like for unreported domestic violence. So certainly uh, something for us to be aware of in the time that we're in now. Mm -hmm. It's a very important thing about domestic violence because prior to the pandemic, the incidence of domestic violence increases um, on Sunday night. You might think that it would be Friday night or Saturday, but it's Sunday night and it's because that's because families have been together in a house usually for several days or two days in a row and and so that aggravations increase and, and cabin fever increases. Imagine what it would be like now when there, it seems Monday through Friday to Sunday, all the days they're in the house together. And, and so it's, that's why I believe we're seeing that domestic um, incident of domestic violence increase. I'm also in the stress of the financial stressors, all the other stressors we've mentioned. So, and, there, and just, there are a couple of things to add something. Um, and, and it's kind of counter to the whole domestic violence situation. My, I'm working from home and my husband works when he can. It kind of depends. But the flip side of it is that there can also be a certain level of dependency because, for example, if you are consistently working apart and you are comfortable with that, then all of a sudden you're kind of there all the time together. So now, if my husband is out of the house, it just feels abnormal because I'm so used to him being around. And that's a positive thing because you can really develop your relationships. Yeah. So it's, those are just one of the things that can kind of add some, some, some enhancement to a relationship, particularly if there has been a struggle in a relationship. Very good point. So, so let me make a couple of points. The incidence and severity of intimate partner violence are both up. Both what's being reported, and sadly, is that the numbers of reports of child abuse are down. And the reason, it's not to say the incident is down, the reporting is down because many of the reports come from schools and sure. teachers. And oh. Children are not in school right now. So, so that's the problem. I have some comments here. Uh, relating to some of what we've spoken about, and one is along with our young children suffering, so many of our teens are full of anxiety and are depressed, and that they have parents who are dealing with their own feelings and not able to validate what the teens are experiencing. And mm -hmm. then someone else said, I, it was hard for me because I couldn't attend my father's funeral due to the COVID restrictions. Yeah, but, uh, and yeah. We with teens, not only are they stressed because of what's happening in their house and with, with their parents, but teenagers are usually highly social individuals. 
and mm -hmm. can't interact in person with their peers, that can promote depression. What's your comment, Kent? I'm, I'm sorry I interrupted. No, no, that, that, um, I, I was talking, going back to what Wanda was saying, um, not Wanda, Donna, um, the incidence of choking domestic violence, um, has been, um, actually one of the, the, um, our county executive, uh, created a, um, apparatus we use to help us to identify victims that are, are choking. Choking is one of the, um, it jumps out as one of the, um, biggest things that happens in physical assaults. And we now have an initiative to monitor that because we're seeing it so frequently now in our emergency rooms that we want to be able to sure to capture it um, and support people in crisis. So, again, mm -hmm. and, the, and the deaths related to domestic violence, mm -hmm. even though we see people who make it to the emergency room, uh, uh, the report I got last week was that the deaths have doubled um, in our domestic violent cases that across the state. So um, this is something to really look at um, as we go further into this endemic. Absolutely. And I will point out also before I go to the next slide that the domestic violence and child abuse are highly underreported crimes. These are crimes of secrecy usually, unless there is an injury so serious that, that a person has to go to an emergency room. And so at the end of at the end of this entire uh, conversation will have some resources related to child abuse and domestic violence as well as a number of other things if people are looking for that sort of resource. Excellent. Excellent. I appreciate that. And so next slide please. So we, we've, I have talked a lot about the, the very serious nature of this, the, the grief and the stress of this. I think it's important to give us a sense of hope to, to talk about the purpose of grief. And there can be grief for death, there could be grief for loss of relationships, loss of opportunities, loss of income, all those things we just mentioned. But what is the importance and purpose of grief? Well, first of all, it signals that something is different. That's the whole purpose of grief. Something is different. It's an intention getter. We can't ignore it. And so, Something is different, and that is also a signal that we're going to have to adapt. Some of you have heard that saying, adapt or die. We have to adapt or die. And so something is different, and that pushes us into um, a situation where it demands our time and attention. Grief requires time and attention. Wow. It can promote and should promote the creation of new neurons in our brain. Why is that important? Well, if we're going to adapt, then we have to have new connections. We can't get those new connections or make those new connections satisfactorily or, or with the, the, in the right amount unless we're able to give it the time and attention it requires. In addition to time and attention, it requires courage, strength, and grace. Wow. And it does rely on personal fortitude. And if you feel that, oh, I can't take it, I can't stand it, I don't want to think about it, I don't want to look at it, I want to be medicated through this, I, I don't want to talk about it, I want even to talk about it. But if, if you don't, then, then you don't get the, the growth that is necessary. And the growth that comes from grief, by the way, prepares us for future loss. Because if any of you, and I doubt it, if any of you on the panel, and I doubt it, maybe even those who aren't, have never had a loss in your life. Most of us have, and it's kind of the rule that you don't get out of this life unscathed. But if you, if you develop an approach to these losses and, and take it as this is, has importance and purpose, then you get stuck. Well, let's talk about that some more. Have the next slide, please. And, and, and Deborah, just to add to that, this slide. Yeah. Um, one of the um, disturbing trends we're finding is that people are grieving and finding ways to grieve in a, an unhealthy way. Um, uh -huh. Using a alcohol um, that's up here in the county, alcohol abuse, um, mm -hmm. as well as marijuana and PCT. Um, mm -hmm. Those three things have a numbing effect. Uh, one's an antidepressant. And people, re, um, it's the way of saying the world around me is crazy, but yet the, this substance will give me ability to cope. And, and I think in this webinar, we're going to learn more healthy ways to adapt 
uh, with the absence of using substances to support a person's crisis. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm sorry. I wanted to mention another thing. I'm sorry. Um, but I wanted to just say and emphasize how normal and human it is to grieve. And so those grief reactions are expected and normal. And mm -hmm. I think human nature wants us to sort of perhaps wish it would go away or try to suppress it. But the, as you said, something that I just want to like put a personal underline on, and that is growth happens when you move through the pain and come to the other side of it. But it's painful to move through grief, and that's why our human nature is to not want to do it. But the more we obstruct or try not to move through the grief and move through the pain, the more likely it is to cause something more debilitating down the That's road. correct. And, and I'll be touching on that. Um, but, yes, the, those comments are, are, are very important, and it does set the stage um, for, for what's coming next. Um, the polling question is, how has loss affected you during the COVID-19 pandemic? So if you, if you want to, to type in your questions, I unfortunately cannot see those questions. I'm relying kind of on Donna to read yeah. them from time to time. Um, I'm happy to do it. While, while people type in their answers, um, I think that will be great. And let me, while they're doing that, let me just acknowledge for you all a couple of things that I have seen pop up here, which is um, uh, one viewer wrote that this really has taken a toll on my family. Everyone's struggling. I've got four children. They're home. They're virtual learning. Um, and, you know, we're trying to pay bills, and we have loss of our extra income. It was really tough, and it's heartbreaking to begin to think about the holidays. Someone also um, signaled that they clearly identified with the entire slide about the what ifs. Mm -hmm. And let me just say that uh, there was a question here about how do we redirect from the what ifs? And I will tell you all that that is part of the conversation that we'll have after the lunch break. We're going to, we, we've talked about getting those feelings out on the table, understanding that you're not alone, and so many of us are feeling these things. And then we're going to shift. Uh, after lunch to talk about, and what do you do with all of that? How do you keep yourself well? Right. So, uh, right. And, and Donna, just to add to that, I, I think, and I, I appreciate all the panelists here, um, self-disclosure and sharing their own feelings of loss, because this is a human experience. None of us excluded from it. And um, so I appreciate um, the things I heard also from the panelists, because again, many of the um, persons will respond have the same senses of loss um, that, that we all share as a as a human community. Yeah. I do want to ask. Uh, someone right. commented in, in response to what you said, Connie, a moment ago that I learned that from counseling from counseling I learned to feel the pain of loss so that I could heal. I think that's a, a really important question. And people are beginning to tell us how they are trying to deal with all of this. And one person said, I mandated that my family have nightly prayers virtually. And that's something that we do together. Very good. I'll right. dovetail, I'm going to dovetail off of something that Donna said about two beats back, and that is we're not going to leave you comfortless. <laughs> my, Kent and my portion of the program was to, to identify clearly where our grief maybe is coming from, where our stresses are coming from. But as we get into the second part of our program, there will be suggestions and, and um, ability for you to acquire coping mechanisms. Can I get the next slide, please? Okay. So the nature of grief, whether your grief is over a death or a loss of a relationship or a loss of financial security, jobs, on and on. I could go on. And by the way, it's not part of this program, but I'm going to add it in here. Loss of youth. If we ever get a chance, I'd love to do a talk about the grief that comes with losing youth. But with it... If there's an acknowledgement that there will be bad days, there will be very, very bad days, <laughs> particularly in the early stages of grief, where where you're asking it, it, why, and you're filled with disbelief, anger, fear, longing. All of those things are not only normal, but necessary. Grief is necessary, and every emotion that accompanies it. 
But then after bad days, eventually you'll have some okay days. But then with okay days, sometimes comes guilt. How can I feel even the least little bit okay when everything is not okay in my world anymore? But, but you need to acknowledge that, that those things will occur, but then followed by more bad days. Maybe if you've lost a loved one, you hear their favorite song on the radio, or you come across photographs, or it's time to clear out their closet or their, their dresser drawer. So bad days, okay days, more bad days, which eventually are followed by tolerable days much of the time. Notice I didn't say good days. There's got to be a period where there's just tolerable days. I can get through my day. I can do what I need to do. I can take care of myself my activities of daily living and take care of what I need to. And then eventually, one day, without you even noticing, you just you sort of it sneaks up on you and you're having two good days in a row. Mm -hmm. They're not the same kind of days. But go ahead, Wanda. No, go ahead. After you finish, Deborah, I would like to read a meditation on grief. I will. Thank you. I appreciate that. But these mostly good days, and notice like we go back and forth between the bad, the okay, bad, tolerable, and good days. What finally lands on us is the new normal. The new normal, where we have to establish ourselves in this, this world where things are very different. My loved one's not here. My old job, which I love, is not here. I couldn't complete college. I, I, on and on, the new normal. Go ahead, Rhonda, please. Okay, thank you. Um, you said something about um, the loss of youth. Well, I turned 65 in February, and I wanted to celebrate the entire year. Well, obviously, I can't do that. You make the best of it. But I wanted to read a meditation that I shared with my grief group the other day, and it's called Guide to Surviving Grief. Cry whenever you need to. Scream, shout, lay on the floor, cry in the shower, be still. Run, walk, create, live your truth, share without fear, listen, release your pain, breathe, be courageous, throw away the map, wander, be real, be compassionate, read, seek friendship, be vulnerable, don't fear being broken. Thank you. I like Go ahead, Ken. No, Wanda, you know, I, I wish I could take that that a meditation poem and give it to our men, men in barbershops and men in general. So many of our men, and I'm just using the term, uh, emotionally constipated. Uh, mm -hmm. This is definitely, and I'm a man, so, you know, I'm, I'm naturally, I don't want to cry and when I'm crying, you know, but as a, as a trained um, clinician, I know that that's healthy. But a lot of our men don't do what you just mentioned, and, and that is some direct work that we can do to encourage each other as we move through this endemic. Thank you for that. Excellent. And as therapists or mental health providers, I don't know if some of you on the panel are, I am, it's okay to, to model that to your clients and your therapists. It doesn't mean you're being ineffective or, or using your, your clients if they know that you have suffered losses too. And if they, if they cry, it's okay if you become choked up too. You're not going to bawl or wail, but to show that you do understand on a cellular level what they're experiencing, and that's that's perfectly fine. Next slide, please. So we're going to reframe grief as a necessary emotion. It is necessary in order to to move forward, and delaying is prolonging. If you put off grief, if you delay grief, it will only prolong it. Some of my patients started out on benzodiazepines 10 or 15 or 20 years ago when their husband or someone they were close to died, and they are still taking them. And they say to me, well, I haven't cried in 20 years. Well, I worry about them because crying is a necessary expression of, of very important emotions. So, delaying is prolonging. And this learning curve, again, it's, you know, we review a curve, I don't know if you can see me, but there are, are tails and then there's a height and a curve. If you turn away from grief, if you refuse to embrace it, you will not be able to get to the safe part. 
And again, I, I get that that's some protective thing. You're trying to avoid feeling the, the total pain, but but it doesn't really help you in the end. We have to also realize the transient nature nature of emotion. Emotion is here. It, it, it comes, it goes, it comes and goes all day, every day. And if we can acknowledge our emotions without judging it, and this is important. Sometimes people say, I feel so horrible. This is, I'm depressed. I'm anxious. I can't stand it one more minute. I just want to die because it's horrible. Well, they're judging their emotions. And that judgment is what is promoting so much pain. If we can acknowledge that we feel sad or angry or frustrated or fearful, and then let it move on so the next emotion follows it, and we don't hold on to it with closed fists. Very, very important. Next slide, please. I'm aware of the time constraint. Reframing grief means that we have to feel our emotions. That means all of them, the good ones, the not so good ones, the ones that seem like they're painful. Unless you are able to feel all of your emotions fully and let them move on, you will be stuck with them. They become toxic. If you swallow your emotion, it becomes toxic turns into something that's worse, depression, anxiety, um, become perhaps suicidal, don't want to live. So celebrating emotion, that's an interesting thing. My, my patients often say, why should I celebrate feeling depressed? Well, perhaps if you celebrate all of your emotions, not just the ones where you're depressed, you'll see that you have every emotion in the rainbow, not just the dark ones, not just the gray ones. You have the red and orange and yellow ones as well. So we're going to celebrate emotion. We need to begin living fully by being present, and that means being present even in the difficult throes of grief, to be present. Realizing the power of here and now and resisting the desire to remain stuck. Wow, I'm sure they're going to speak about that some more this afternoon, so I don't want to, to say much more on that. Here's my last slide. We're going to reframe grief by learning from it. Grief was necessary. Grief was here. I tolerated it, didn't like it too much, but I learned what I was supposed to learn from it, so I acquired resilience. Wow. What is the benefit of requiring, acquiring resilience? It means it will help us be prepared when things happen again in the future. And I'm preaching to the choir, I'm sure. Anyone who's logged on realizes what I'm saying. But as I pointed out a moment ago, there's no getting through this life without grief and sorrow. But if we are resilient, it won't blow us out of the water every time. It helps us to overcome fear. It will reveal grace. And finally, we reframe grief, eventually we find peace. And that peace allows us to have strength for what comes after. Donna, are there other questions that I can't see that you would like to bring out? Yes, uh, yes, thank you very much. Let me just first of all say to each of you that this conversation has been tremendously impactful and so informative and so important. Um, we can't address everything that's coming in, and, and I, if I misspoke and referred to the chat box, I apologize. If you want to send your comments, then do so on the Q&A, and there have been many, many, many people who have written in about the loss of our family and family relationships and have certainly raised the issue of what do we do about Thanksgiving. That, might, that, was, that came in early and late, um, several references to Thanksgiving. How many people are safe, and I'm sure it was meant to be directed to Dr. Callahan, who had to leave because he's tending to some of our alternative care sites for COVID um, this morning. But I, let me just comment, although I'm not a clinician, that the general advice, and I admit I'm one of those 24-7 news junkies, and it's on all the time, but the recommendations are to celebrate, find new ways to celebrate, do as much as you can virtually, or stay outside. Um, keep to the family that you live with. I know it's a mm -hmm. struggle, but if we bond, bind together and do this right, our time period where we suffer will be shorter than the prolonging that you, that you mentioned. So stay only with the people that you know. That's the recommendation. It's projected that air travel is going to go up dramatically 
and it, it's probably the wrong thing to do. Um, right. So scientists are asking that we cancel those trips. So there's um, a couple, several other interesting things. Kent, someone said thank you so much for mentioning alcohol and raised the issue of the promotion of the wine and liquor deliveries right to home. I know early in the pandemic, mm-hmm. the liquor sales went up about 235%. That was an April statistic, so I can only imagine what they are now. But someone said it's even exacerbated by the fact that people are having it delivered right to home. Um, there was a question about introverts and extroverts. Do you find that introverts and extroverts are experiencing the residuals of COVID on their mental health similarly, or is it disparate based upon their orientation? I can speak to the fact that my my um, therapy, which is daily, three hours a day, Monday through Friday, used to be in person. And when we went to a virtual format, we had people log on who were introverts who could could not tolerate going out in a, in a group setting even before the pandemic. And so they have expressed some relief that now they're included in some way, that we've found a remedy to include them. So the question is, I do believe that introverts and extroverts do experience the pandemic in different ways. Neither is good or bad. It ain't nothing but a thing, not a good thing or a bad thing. Um, But if we can reach more people, then maybe the one good thing that comes from this pandemic is that when we do resume to some normality and we can bring people back into to offices and hospitals for treatment, we can have a hybrid kind of thing where those who, who can't leave their houses still will be able to be seen in a virtual format. I think that's priceless. So, so Deborah, just to, I, you know, I'm, I'm jumping over here, what you just mentioned. I, I just reopened um, our PHP, our um, outpatient behavioral health um, program, and, and all our extroverts not only were there early, they were, like, happy that they could be back <laughs> sure. and, are, and are giving us 120% devotion. Um, and, and what you mentioned, we are creating a virtual format so people who are more introverted uh, mm-hmm. will have the same um, access to services as our extroverts. But, yes, they were happy, and, and some of them uh, waited until we got it back open because that, that's a, the better place. They need to share that mm-hmm. human experience um, live. Yeah. I want to add something, Kent. Um, I've had a couple of clients that attend NA or AA, and the extroverts, it was really hard for them to do the sessions virtually because they're used to having that face-to-face contact and talking. Uh, one lady said, I just can't get with that, and she really was struggling, which was a concern. But I have another guy who is very much an introvert. It didn't bother him at all that he was able to do the virtual. So it really just kind of depends. But that was an interesting um, situation, recognizing the difference between those two people. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. So Dr. Dr. Callahan was able to join us again. And uh, did we lose him? He was on for a second there. He's there. Uh, so, Chuck, I tried my hand at advice about Thanksgiving and stay only with the family that you live with as the best advice. But some people are asking, what do we do about the holidays? What would you say as the real expert here? Yeah, so I, I, I heard what you said, Donna, and I, I apologize, but I, I, um, I, I agree with everything you said. I mean, we're all sort of struggling with this. I mean, Thanksgiving and Christmas, uh, as the father of seven and the, grand, the grandfather of seven, are big, are big holidays for us. It's going to be difficult for us to do it very differently. But I, I do think the, the advice, uh, certainly if you live in Baltimore City, the mayor has set uh, guidelines uh, in the state of Maryland uh, the, the, the governor has set guidelines. They're available on the coronavirus website for both the city and the, 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 the state. I think we have to stay within those guidelines. Uh, I think we have learned that it's really high risk to eat around each other without masks on. And, and when we've seen outbreaks happen within healthcare facilities, it's very often happening in, in, in when people eat together. Uh, and it sort of makes sense that that's how the virus would be spread. And so that makes Thanksgiving, which is its focal point, sort of eating and sitting and watching football games together, particularly high risk, I think. So, Don, I heard what you said. Uh, I think many of us are going to have very different Thanksgivings this year uh, because, be, because of these restrictions and because of the risk of being together. So I, I think your, your point 
about eliminating or modifying or doing things differently is a good one. I think, you know, if we would just and think just, about I'd this like as an opportunity to be creative. I... I'm sorry, Connie. If we would just think about this as an opportunity to be creative mm -hmm. and get online with your family and play some games or mm -hmm. cook the same recipes together, we might be advantaged. And we, we all just want to stay safe. Connie? Well, what I was You're going to say yes. is that, you know, I think one of the things to keep in perspective about this year's holidays is that we're going to do something that is perhaps drastically different from what we usually do so that next year it can be much more normal. And that is something that's hard for our American culture because we want it now and we want what we want now. <laughs> Uh, as, as a generalization, but I think that um, if we try to think of the consequences that are potentially uh, the, the fallout from close social gatherings and being around people that you don't know what they are doing in terms of protection um, and, and what they might be exposed to. I heard uh, someone say it's like uh, being with someone and everybody else that they've been with that you don't know about. Sure. So uh, it's hard for us to delay our gratification, but I think that um, thinking about the most normal possible way it will be in 2021 is the best outcome we can for what we do for the end of 2020. Very good. And as we're finishing up, I want to add one more thing, and it's about liquor stores. Um, where I work in my hospital and in our University of Maryland system, we have not only mental health treatment, we have substance abuse treatment. And when the pandemic started and things were closing down, many people were annoyed that the liquor stores stayed open. And they said, well, well that's not an essential service. But it, for those who would go through dangerous withdrawal from alcohol, it was an essential service. I mean, and for those of you who don't suffer from addiction, you might still be saying, well, I still don't see the, why it's important. So some, some facilities that were rehabs were closing because of COVID, and that left those who were seeking treatment um, without an outlet. So I, I wanted to, to sort of push that in there a little bit. Thank you, everybody, for, for listening to us, and we're actually coming up to lunchtime. We're only two minutes past 12. I feel positive about that. All right. Well, there are many comments here saying thank you for this segment on grief and asking Wanda to share the poem or the meditation that she read. What we can do, as I mentioned, we will have this entire conversation online in about two days, and Wanda, if you don't mind, we can share it there as well, and I'll give the site in a little bit. Let us now take a break, digest this really wonderful uh, presentation and conversation that you all have engaged us in, uh, and, re and everybody get some lunch, get something to drink, and then rejoin us at 1230. You can simply leave the link open and then just come back to it at 1230. We'll start right on that on the dot. Or if you sign out, just come back in on the link that you use to get in. And, again, we apologize for the tiny bit of a late start. We had to uh, redirect the link for some. So thank you all for joining us. We hope to see you back at 1230 as we talk about now what to do and we talk about resilience and really building your toolkit to keep yourselves well. See you at 1230. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. We had a terrific morning with our panelists and great discussion amongst uh, all of them and with so many of you. Thank you for sharing in such an open way. As a reminder, you can still continue to utilize the question and answer box to pose questions or to make comments if you like, and we'll go through and try to address as many of those as is possible. So here this afternoon to share with us the important work of building your toolkit 
and keeping yourself mentally and emotionally mm-hmm. well are two speakers whom we've had participate with us before. They're Wanda Binns and Dr. Connie Knoll. Ms. Binns is a master's trained, licensed clinical social worker with over 30 years experience. She has extensive background and expertise in counseling related to relationships, addiction, stress, and depression. Ms. Binns is the manager of the University of Maryland Medical System Employee Assistance Program for all of our employees, 28,000 employees in the, uh, in the UM system. And Dr. Knoll is a certified psychiatric nurse practitioner at the University of Maryland Upper Chesapeake Health System in Bel Air. She's a national leader in psychiatric nursing. She has served as the chair of the Recovery Council of the American Psychiatric Nurses Association, and she's been front and center in many of this nation's uh, major crises and disasters. Um, I first met her upon hearing stories about her volunteering uh, at Hurricane Katrina. She's also participated as a counselor and an expert following the Oklahoma City bombing and a, a number of other things. And she was also on site as part of the disaster team following the um, United Flight 93 crash in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, in September 2001, and as well later in New York City. So, ladies, pleased to have you join us again, participants. This is an opportunity for us to take the information that we've heard and certainly our experiences and figure out with the, these experts what to do moving forward to keep ourselves well. Connie? Thank you so much, Sonia. It's really an honor and a privilege to be here this afternoon as part of this really uh, wonderful experience for our community. I do want to just say what we hope to cover in the next 90 minutes is defining what is normal during a pandemic, during a disaster, the concept of building a wellness toolkit, or if you would prefer to think of it as a backpack, and what might be in that for you that you can utilize, and to have some thoughts about how to move forward with surviving and thriving during this um, period. I think that one of the things that was really great about this morning's presentation is that it was really helpful to identify and label some of the feelings and things that are going on because one of the first steps in dealing with emotions is understanding what emotions you're having and really putting a name to them. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the myth of normal because it is a myth. Uh, Many people think that those of us in clinical practice have some sort of yardstick for measuring normality. And the fact is that it, it, what is normal for you is different than what may be normal for someone else. It depends on you as an individual and where you are. And right now I'd like to say that a lot of us feel like we're upside down in that tree like that cow um, and that at least part of the time, it does feel like the world is a little bit upside down and not what it was for all the reasons that Dr. Callahan was talking about this morning in terms of this is a new global threat that we don't have a lot of experience with. So what are the, some of the normal um, emotions as we said in great detail this morning And what I'd like to summarize here is that these emotions are important as human beings because they allow us to survive. So what happens in disasters and in this current pandemic is that we are normalizing what is very abnormal to us. So I took this to heart in thinking about this presentation And I was thinking about how I felt early in uh, late February and March 
when things really got uh, to be quite different. And I will tell everyone that I had a great deal of anxiety and I had fear. And then I was thinking about how did I, how did I move that for myself? And one of the things that um, struck me was that, you know, anxiety is sort of a free-floating um, negative emotion about what is uncertain. And we still have a lot of uncertainty about what's going on with COVID. But what is fear is something uh, that has a specific target. And so it, it began to occur to me that I, have, I had turned some of my anxiety into what I would think of and label as a healthy fear. And I know what to do about a healthy fear. I know what I can do to protect myself from things that I'm afraid of. So that was something that for me was transformative in terms of how I was handling my daily life in thinking about I've moved from Yes, there is some uncertainty, and there's things that I don't know, and there's things that I can't control, but I can deal with a healthy fear. So one of the other things that I need to say is that norms are also defined by age, uh, culture, community, and our society, and it's as if the virus in itself wasn't enough. We are also in the midst of what feels like major cultural shifts, social unrest, other uncertainties that have piled on to the COVID experience, if you will, because they've actually affected the COVID experience. There was some talk this morning about people who don't believe that the virus really exists and that masks aren't necessary and that uh, have been openly defiant or even violent about about uh, taking appropriate precautions. And these things have affected how we're all dealing with it in themselves. So what I'm just going to say about this is that we're in the midst of a flux culturally in our community and our society about a, a number of things, which is also adding to the feel, if you will, that this is an abnormal sort of time. So it's even harder to think about what's normal. And it's harder to think about what's normal because what's normal this week hasn't been normal last month. So even the abnormals change frequently. And again, this is because this is a novel virus that's a global pandemic that we are gaining experience from every day. So uh, the next slide, um, I'm not going to say too much more about this because it was well-defined this morning, but I wanted to say that, you know, we talked about loss of life, we talked about loss of livelihoods, and there were many things that Deborah was able to really eloquently uh, describe that feels like these little sliver of losses every day, empty grocery shelves can't go to weddings, uh, graduations, and, and things like that. And sometimes all those slivers pile up to feel like it's a major cut. So even if we haven't been directly affected by a devastating loss, the new normals and constant change may feel as though we are experiencing devastating loss. Some people will feel that in anticipation of trying to define a new normal for our holiday season this year. So human, humans don't really like change. We like, we like routines. We don't like disruptions in our routines. And, and what we're dealing with is like a constant evolution of what's new normal. So the key to keep in mind here is that Normal is fluctuating. Normal is individual and normal is fluctuating and we don't have a true sense of what is normal for us in this, except for some 
some of the things I'm going to talk about in a minute. So next slide. <clears throat> so one of the other things that I think is important to think about, oh, I'd like to go back to the little cartoon. The little cartoon that says, it, it's a, it has some people on it that talks about um, everybody else seems so happy and normal. I wish I wasn't the only person with these kind of issues. So, and the reason why I put this up is that many people feel like they're the only ones or that there's no help or that they're alone. And one of the things I want to really underline this presentation is that you're not alone uh, and everyone has felt this impact of these negative emotions some in more severe ways than others, but everyone feels these in, in a global way. So you're not alone and everyone else, including I think as we've all shared today, we've had our own issues that we are dealing with as well. So now for the next slide. So one of the things that's really important to distinguish in terms of normality and what you may need to do has to do with trying to figure out whether you are, uh, if you will, in quotations, just stressed or whether you have an inability to function. And so these are some key questions to ask yourself in terms of am I able to function? And one of the key areas is, are you getting enough sleep? Now, I would say that for many of us, having occasional, and maybe more than occasional disruption in sleep may be an indication, a trigger for a worsening mood. But if you're not, if you haven't slept for weeks to a month, that would be an indicator that you're in that area where I would be concerned about you as a clinician. I would be wondering what I could help you with and whether you needed more professional help or some therapy if you were going for weeks to months without sleep. Another key question to ask yourself is, Am I taking care of myself and others that I'm responsible for? I have had several people talk to me about how difficult it is to do the virtual school learning and take care of them and take care of their home and perhaps take, try to work from home as well. And there are times when individuals have said, I just couldn't handle it that day, or I couldn't handle it that morning. But then I've asked them to reflect on, well, are, how are your children doing in that situation? And their children have done pretty well. So they may feel, or you may feel that they're not doing well, and you may not be giving yourself credit for the things that you're actually accomplishing. Along with that is, am I getting things done? So yes, if you are providing food for your family as best as you can, to having nothing in the house and not doing anything about it, again, I would wish on a continuum of whether you're just or whether you're in an area that might be considered you need you need additional help. And the last question is, do I feel safe? This has many parameters, and I was glad this morning to talk about the domestic violence issues. There are increased suicides since the pandemic has hit us. And so a question to ask do you feel safe with yourself? Do others around you feel safe? And again, what I would start resources at the end to uh, have hotlines to to um, reach out for suicide help, to reach out for domestic uh, violence help. But one of the questions 
ask yourself as to whether you just experience the expected stress as opposed to an inability to really function in this issue of safety. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> I talked a little bit about this, from anxiety to healthy fear and to minimize risk. And I felt that it was important, even though we're talking about the emotional part of this, because these physicals can make you feel better. So, so I we're talking uh, uh, extensively in a few moments about a wellness toolkit or a backpack, and I put here need a raincoat because, you know, when we're expecting a hurricane or a severe storm. We prepare for that, hopefully. We wear extra outer gear. And if we're going to be in a real cold snap with a blue scissor, we wear lots of extra gear. We cover our face because we don't want our breasts to freeze. <laughs> and um, we do things about having provisions. And so what I would like to say is that there is an analogy here to preparing for very bad weather. And the difference here is that we're preparing for the very, very bad weather and the potential for something every day with no end in sight. And it's invisible, so we can't see it. But it's the same analogy of protecting ourselves, being able to act in a physical way that makes us feel less anxious. And I would just really like to emphasize that we need to trust the science and the evidence. And I'd like to say that the evidence is 100 years old. Even in the last pandemic over 100 years ago, the virus was curtailed by people staying indoors and wearing masks. We've come a long way from that, and we have more tools physically to help ourselves that have to do with wearing the mask, maintaining social distance, avoiding large gatherings and crowds, like I mentioned this morning, being around people that you don't you don't know it's being around all the people that they've been around and you don't know what kind of precautions they took before. Wash your hands frequently. Avoid touching your face. And trust the science and the evidence. And I would just, again, analyze your risk, review that, and do everything you can to stay safe. That will make you feel better right off the bat. Next slide, please. And now I'm going to turn it over to Wanda to talk a lot more about toolkit. used to talking in front of people. And the first time I did this presentation back in April, I was really nervous because I wasn't used to the format. So typically I would say my knees were sh knocking, but my knees weren't knocking, I was sitting down, so it was my butt that was knocking. But anyway, I learned to cope with it and get on with it. So right now I'm gonna be talking about a wellness toolkit. What doesn't break you makes you stronger. And I think um, Deborah had mentioned something about, or maybe Connie, about some people have different ways of functioning or coping. So prior to the pandemic, if you had a pretty healthy sense of self, chances are you're going to go into this with a better outlook, hopefully, in terms of coping with adversity. But if you were broken and did not have very healthy coping mechanisms, this certainly could be a challenge. But what I want to talk to you about is the importance of recognizing that even though we're going through adversity, that we can come through on the other side and cope a lot better than we give ourselves credit for. Trauma doesn't have to defeat you. It can be a perfect opportunity for growth. Don't just make a comeback. Use it as a catalyst forward. I like that because it really talks about the fact that sometimes we go through really horrendous situations, but sometimes we look for the light in the midst of the darkness and we can find our way through. Next slide, please.
resilience, our capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. And that goes back to what I was talking about with regard to how healthy were you prior to the situation that you're going through. And while we're talking about the pandemic, it truly can be any particular situation in your life. And sometimes some of us have the ability to survive and go through very well. And some of us just don't. Um, a really good friend of mine lost her daughter and um, then she developed, um, she developed COVID as a result of going to the funeral. After that, she lost her husband and since then she's lost a very close aunt of hers. And the struggle is that she's not doing great, but she has been hanging in there. And I, I sent her a card about faith because I think sometimes when we draw from some of the darkest moments that we have and just hold on to whatever it is that gives you strength and it encourages you, that's how you can develop your resilience. Psychological resilience is the individual ability to cope with stress and adversity. When I got on a call this morning, I really didn't know what was going on and I could feel the panic and whoever was talking. And I got off because I wasn't quite sure what was going on. And then as I got back on, I realized that it, things just were not flowing as well as we would want. And I realized what I tell clients all the time is sometimes we just need to take step back, take a deep breath and just take take our mind off whatever it is that's going on. That's what psychological resilience is all about. It's when you recognize that you're feeling stressed and you're feeling overwhelmed and you're able to reframe what's going on and find some healthy coping me mechanisms to cope with whatever it is that you've been through. As a clinician, and I've been doing this for 30 years, it's just so refreshing when you see someone that is so broken and you see how they have turned their lives around and they're changing and they can talk positivity into their own life. It's just absolutely amazing. I experienced that last night with one of my clients and I didn't cry, but I was a little emotional because I, when I saw the level of brokenness that she had at the very beginning about several months ago and to see how this young lady has truly grown, it's, it's nothing short of miraculous. That's what resilience and psychological resilience looks like, post-traumatic growth. And all of these issues are very much intertwined. So post-traumatic growth is positive changes that occur as a result of surviving a traumatic event. So if you think about the pandemic on a whole, it truly is a traumatic event. Most of us have not experienced anything like this in our lifetime. Even though we've been going through this for several months, sometimes when I go outside and I just kind of look around, it still seems surreal to me. It seems like a movie that I'm not in, but I'm visualizing. Everybody's walking around with the mask or gloves or whatever. But this is our reality. And it's about how do you manage to cope with in the midst of all of this crazy stuff that's going on and find a way to get beyond it. And it truly is an individual choice, and it helps if you have strong coping mechanisms prior to the event. In this case, we're talking about the pandemic. But as I said before, there are some people that are not as emotionally healthy and do have a hard time with coping when these events do occur. Next slide, please. Civility. <clears throat> I'm sure we all can use a bit of civility because the past year has been extremely extraordinary with so many things that have been going on um, within our country and perhaps within our families or our workplace. And I think it's just so important that we just take the time to recognize the importance of just being kind to people, just talking to people with respect and dignity. Sometimes I think we get caught up in the moment of the situation and our emotions go haywire because we're reacting to the stimulus that's going on. But when you think about civility, you want to think about <clears throat> just treating people with common courtesy or respect. It should not make, it should not be or feel like a grand gesture when you give it. So in other words, if it's just something you normally and naturally do, it's just going to come as a part of who you are as a person. When civility is a part of our value system and upbringing, it comes and flows from you naturally. 
if you really stop and think about it, while we come from different backgrounds, we may have different political beliefs or spiritual beliefs, there are more things that we have in common than things that make us different. And I think we tend to lose sight of that when you're in the midst of some kind of traumatic event, whatever the case may be. You may want to decide, well, this group of people thinks like this, or this group of people thinks like that. We're entitled to think what we think. It's just a matter of being able to respect that in spite of the differences, it doesn't mean that I have to treat you with disrespect. So I just wanted to throw that in because I think it's important to recognize that a simple gesture of kindness goes a long way. Next slide. I cannot control. I really love this slide. I think it's so important to remember there are so many things in our lives that we cannot control. In the 30 years that I've been doing this, I oftentimes talk to people about the importance of recognizing there are just certain things that you can't control, and it's okay to accept that. For example, if you have, <clears throat> I remember I listened to um, Yana Von Zant many, many years ago, and she was talking about forgiveness. And the analogy that she gave was that Uncle Joe ate the very last Oreo cookie, and you're still pissed off with him about that. Well, Uncle Joe is dead and buried, and you're still carrying that. Think about it. You couldn't control the fact that Uncle Joe may have eaten the last cookie, or maybe he said something really mean or nasty to you. But if you decide to allow something that someone has said or done dictate how you feel, how you act, it certainly can determine what you're going to do in the here and now. So in terms of focusing on the things I cannot control, you can't control other follow the rules of social distancing. When I'm in the store, I'm very vigilant about making sure I'm doing my part. I have my mask, I go in, I wipe my hands, I'm wa always washing my hands. But I don't know that other people are doing that. And I know <laughs> my husband was in the store one time and this one lady was just too close to him. I guess she was a little bit older than him. I'm not really sure. And he asked her if he, if she would back up. And she said, you don't know who you're talking to. I'm not the one. And all he said was, could you back up? And I'm sure many of us have heard experiences like that where we want to do the right thing, but someone else doesn't want to do the right thing. We don't have control over that. You just keep it moving. You do your part. And that's where the civility comes in. He could have engaged with her and had a disagreement. It wouldn't have been worth the time and energy. Oh, go back. The other thing I can't control are the actions of others. He, my husband certainly couldn't control this, this lady making a, um, big, making a big, um, making a big thing about him asking her to step back. We can't control what will happen. We don't know. And this is where our anxiety comes in because we start thinking ahead about, well, this might happen and that might happen. We have no control. I tell clients to stay focused on the here and now. Today is the only thing that we have control over. We cannot control other people's motives. We don't know why people say or do what they do, but sometimes we get all caught up in our head thinking, well, she must have said this because she thinks this or she thinks that. We don't know. Why entertain that energy? Um, the other thing we can't control <laughs> is the amount of toilet paper at the store. And I have to admit, the toilet paper didn't bother me so much, but the paper towel. And I always would have stuff, but in the very beginning, as Ken said, and you went in the store and you couldn't find it, it's like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? And I like the brands that I like. Well, guess what? I had to go with off-brands. It did the same thing. That's the important thing. Um, the next thing we can't control is how long this is going to last. And that's one of those moments that we don't know. When we first started working from home back in March, we certainly didn't anticipate we would still be doing this, and here it is, November. And so there were certain things we put in place and certain things that were not in place, but we've had to learn how to improvise. The other thing we can't control is how others will react. We don't, and guess what? We're not responsible for that. We're only responsible for how we choose to act. The things that I control, I can control. These are the things that I want to encourage you to focus on. Your positive attitude. And it's not being a Pollyanna, but it's just trying to find the sunny side of certain things. How I follow the CDC recommendations. 
that's a choice. I strongly encourage you to do that. We've heard Dr. Um, I don't remember his name, our doctor that spoke earlier. <clears throat> he was giving us some very, yes, he was giving us some very specific scientific information about the pandemic. We have seen the news, and I know some people talk about the fake news, but I can honestly say that um, I have a friend that, a couple of friends that have tested positive, and one is still struggling. But I also lost a brother-in-law back in April as a result of the virus, so I know for me this is very real. The other thing that I can control is my own social distancing. As I said, my husband and I were hypervigilant about doing what we have to do, turning off the news, that is so critical. This was my plan last week after the election was to stay home. I was off. I was going to devour everything I possibly could. I couldn't do it. My anxiety, my anxiety could not take it. So what I did is I stayed in bed all day and watched mostly Christmas movies. It was the best day of my life in months. I didn't even get anything to eat till late in the afternoon. My husband made me get up and go out and grab something to eat. But truly, it was the best thing that I could have done. I watched some news when he would turn it on, then I would be done. But again, limiting how much news you take in because that can be overwhelming. Limiting my social media. That's the other thing. I was getting my hair done a couple of months ago, and I my um, stylist had on this um, this news report that was on um, Netflix and it was talking about our use of our cell phone. And truly, I have to be honest with you, I never ever thought about looking at my cell phone as being addictive. I thought that's just what kids do. But what I realized is that I'm very addictive to reading the news on my phone, not so much um, on TV, but on my phone, just devouring whatever I can get. It's like first thing in the morning I get up, I don't look at what's on my agenda, that comes after. I don't get up and read my meditation, that comes after. So I have to admit, I realize that reading the news on my phone is part of my addiction to social media. So again, limiting how much social media you take in because that in and of itself, it can either be very inspiring or it can be very um, dysfunctional. Um, my kindness and grace. And you know what, I think as individuals, I think there are many of us that are loving, kind, generous, supportive, and if you continue to manifest those behaviors, it will serve you well. And you know, <clears throat> a smile goes a long way, and I know it's hard to see a smile because we're wearing the mask, but guess what, you look at the eyes and you can see the sparkle in someone's eyes. If someone does a kind gesture, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to say thank you. They can't see the smile, but they can maybe hear it in your voice. Um, finding fun things to do at home. Oh my gosh, this is what I wanted to tell you guys. I love the fall because I love the colors. I just think it's very serene, very peaceful, very pretty, just beautiful, which is why I got married in October. Well, typically, you know, we're traveling, going here and there. And my anniversary was a couple of weeks ago, and I wanted to go up to Pennsylvania to catch some of the foliage. And we didn't see as much as I had hoped, but we did see some. <clears throat> my next door neighbor, I'm sorry, my neighbor across the street has two huge trees in her yard. I don't know what kind of trees they are. They have, they had, the wind and rain has knocked them all down, the most beautiful golden yellow leaves I have seen in a long time. I could relate to that. I feel at peace with that. I get so much joy and appreciation because I can't travel and do what I would like to do. So it's about trying to connect with those things that give you peace. The other thing that gives me peace is my husband has a 1939 Pontiac. It is awesome. I feel like a movie star when I'm in a car because we get, well, truly the car gets the attention. We just get the side effects of it. But when we're in that car, we're old school Motown sound and playing Smokey Robinson, The Temptations. I am jamming to that music with the window down feeling the breeze if it's a nice day. The past couple of days have been awesome, not the past two days, but over the weekend, have been awesome. Just being able to sit outside, 
on my porch or walk around my yard and look at those trees across the street has been amazing. So I wanted to spend a few minutes in that talking about finding fun things to do at home because there's not a lot that we can do, but it's about being creative and, be, and trying to figure out what are some of the things that we can do that make it fun for us. My family has this habit of when, they, when we cook, and I have to admit I started it, I would take a picture. Oh, by the way, I'm an excellent cook. I would take a picture of whatever I cooked, and I would send it to my kids. My kids live in Pennsylvania and North Carolina. So they all started doing that. But because the virus has spiked, we decided not to get together for um, Thanksgiving. So my daughter said she would take pictures. I said, don't even try it. I don't want to see pictures. We can do FaceTime. We can talk. We can play games. But I don't want to see what food you have. Okay, next slide. Well, I just wanted to add a I must add a couple comments to what she said. I think that um, one of the things about learning what you can't control is understanding and expecting that you're going to have moments and maybe periods of time where you feel overwhelmed. And that's okay because it may take you some time to regain that perspective of what you can control. So don't expect to learn this and do it right away. It takes some practice to do. And I loved what you said about appreciating the moments of joy. And one of the things that I just wanted to piggyback on that was I love music. And so one of the things that I do as I'm driving to work is I, I, I also like the, the oldies and of, of many ilks. And I'm definitely the person that you see in the car next to the ground is sort of doing the car dance. <laughs> um, and those are things that make me feel like I can have moments of, of enjoying something. So I would encourage our audience to think about what, what kind of things give you those moments mm -hmm. and string a few. Absolutely. Thank you, Connie. Yeah, so next. Yes, uh, I, I'm going to just, and this would be brief, Deborah. I think that there's a considerable amount of personal joy in controlling ourselves and realizing that it's possible to control oneself. And to, to add to that, there's a lot of personal joy in doing the right thing, even mm -hmm. when others around us are not. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a good point, Deborah. I, I appreciate that. And from the very beginning, my husband and I were committed to following whatever the CDC said because it was for ourselves as well as family and friends. That's a good point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now I'm going to talk about the stress survival guide. Now we have to remember that <clears throat> when we talk about stress, stress doesn't just affect one part of us. It affects us emotionally, it can affect us physically, and it can also affect our soul. So I'm going to talk about our body. It is so important to get healthy sleep. Um, and if, for those of us that are working from home or whatever it is that we're doing, it's just important to get a certain amount of rest so that your mind can be rejuvenated and your spirit can be rejuvenated, moving your body. And one thing I, I really have not been doing is exercising as much as I can. And part of the problem is, for me, I have asthma thanks to moving to Baltimore, but also I am so glued into my computer for work because I, I have like 50,000 things to do. But when I have the time to walk and exercise, I truly, truly love it. I've been thinking about investing in one of those um, new videotapes that I've seen um, with um, some low impact exercise, really dancing. And I said, I can do that. So I'm gonna try and get my groove on by doing that. Getting your nutrients, it is so important to make sure that you're eating well and staying hydrated. Deep breathing, I try to do that on a regular basis just in terms of meditating. Relaxing your muscles, I think this is so important. And I haven't found this, and if anybody has any suggestions, I would appreciate it, because I'm trying to find the right angle to keep my computer so I'm not constantly leaning over and bending, because that certainly affects my back and affects my shoulders. So again, whenever I have a chance to just kind of stretch and relax my muscles, I will do that. Taking a little nap, if that's something that really works for you. One time, and I have to admit, 
I had lunch. I always take a lunch break. I do that faithfully every day because you just need to make sure you get that break between everything that we're doing, whether it's on the phone or in front of the computer. And so I had, um, I love the home and garden shows on. So after I had taken my, I had eaten, I dozed off. I was like 10 minutes late getting on my next session. I felt so bad and that was one of my worst fears. And guess what? It came happen. It wasn't, it happened. It wasn't the end of the world. And I explained to the person what had happened and it hasn't happened again. So I make sure that I take a deep breath and I get some fresh air so I don't do that again. Um, listening to calming music, whatever music that works for you, absolutely enjoy it because it can be very calming. There is an app that we probably see on TV um, called Calm, and just listening to them, to the soothing music in the background of the rain, just for those couple of seconds that it's on the screen, I find very relaxing. Taking a bath can also be very relaxing with candles. Again, these are just some things that you can do to take care of your body. The way to take Wanda, care of your mind. Yes. Wanda, before you move on, yes. I want to offer something, and this is a personal reflection. I am an insomniac, partly because I watch the news 24-7. So mm-hmm. I've got a lavender diffuser in the room. I put lavender on the pillow, and at some point those stopped working. But now I go to YouTube every night and search for sleep sounds. And the ones that work the best, in my view, are the sounds of the ocean. Mm -hmm. You can find them for three hours, eight hours, ten hours, and I sleep through the night. So I offer that to anyone who's having a problem. That is awesome. Thank you, Donna. I may try that as well. So now I'm going to talk about relief. Sorry, Wanda. I just wanted to add to what Donna was saying. Uh, It rained last night, and I opened my windows, and I slept for eight hours. I never, ever sleep for eight hours. But the rain, it must be something with the therapeutic sound of rain yes. that's calm, that it took me to sleep. <laughs> well, obviously, we're talking about something about water that I think is also very calming and soothing as well. Um, okay, so stress survival for the mind. Talk about what's stressing you out. You have several clinicians that are on this call, ladies and gentlemen, and we're talking about the importance of talking about whatever it is that's going on with you, whether it's one such as us, a professional counselor, a colleague, a um, ministerial person, who a really good friend, but just recognizing that it's so important to find someone that you trust. Sometimes it's just someone to listen to, not to give you advice or tell you what to do, but just to listen. And truthfully, that's what we do as clinicians. We can't tell people what to do, although we think about it, but we listen to what they're saying and provide some support and feedback. But again, it's just having an opportunity to talk about what's going on. Keeping a stress journal can also be helpful as well because it kind of takes you from what's in your head in the worst case scenario. You're putting it down on paper. You look at it and you recognize there's some things that are distorted, some things that may be valid. What is it that you can do about it? And again, it's like as you write it down, you're giving yourself permission to also toss it out if you choose to let it go. The next thing is prioritize your time, write list of what needs to be done and when. That can be very helpful for some of us that are on overload with so many things to do. It's just trying to keep track of what you have to do. The next, the next item I think is equally important, breaking the big task into smaller steps. Because sometimes we can be overwhelmed when we think about the enormity of everything that we have to do. Well, we can't do everything that we need to do at one time, but if you can break it down and think about, okay, I can do this on this day, or maybe I can do this, or maybe asking for help if that's possible, because truly in the midst of the pandemic, we can't necessarily get the same help that we we used to be able to. But if there's somebody that can help you and do it safely, don't have a problem with asking for help. Setting healthy habits and rituals. rituals. You have to decide what that is for you. 
is it going to bed at a certain time? Is it getting up at a certain time? Is it praying? Is it walking? Is it eating healthy? Whatever it is that you need to do, define that. If you're not doing that, ask yourself, what's getting in the way that I'm not taking the time to set these healthy goals for myself in terms of making sure I'm taking care of my mind, my body, and my spirit? Um, the last one I already talked about, ask for help, and again, Take that into consideration because of the pandemic. And obviously, seeing a counselor if you feel you're too overwhelmed. And I tell clients this all the time. If you go and see a counselor, chances are you're recognizing something is going on. You need to talk about whatever it is. That's pretty healthy when you recognize that. And chances are when you take that step to do that, there's more motivation to heal and to improve and to get rid of um whatever it is that you're holding on to. But people that have a hard time trusting and opening up because of past hurts or maybe <clears throat> they have not had good experiences, it may be harder to open up. Try talking to one person that you feel you can just open up and just share a little bit, not everything. But there's a lot of um, healing that takes place when you take the chance to open up and talk to a counselor. The last area is soul, engage in positive self-talk. I don't know how many of you, if you make a mistake or have an error, you say, oh my God, you're so stupid, why did you do that? No, that's negative talk, that's negative energy. It's to reframe and recognize, okay, maybe I made a mistake, but guess what? It's not the end of the world, I can do something differently. Practice saying no. I love this. I tell clients all the time, no is a complete sentence. It does not need an explanation. If you're comfortable saying no, it's okay. It's part of self-care. So many of us are people pleasers and we want to do everything to help everyone to the detriment of ourselves, there has to be a balance. So if everybody's asking you, can you do this, can you do that, can you... You can, it's okay to say no. You can tell them Wanda Benz gave you permission to say no. Take a hiatus from social media. Take a hiatus from the news. Take a hiatus from anything that is creating negative energy because the whole idea is to create an atmosphere that gives you this sense of peace, this sense of calm. And I have to do this myself when I'm overwhelmed at work or whatever the case may be, family, I don't answer the phone. I, I don't look at, so, I just take a deep breath and just, I just don't want to talk. I talk every day, all day, but I just don't want to talk. I just want to be into myself. I love to read, so I'll find something to read that gives me a sense of peace. It's important to accept that stress is a normal part of life. We're not going to get through life without having some kind of stress. It can be positive or negative. But the key is deciding how are you going to deal with the stress that's in your life. Try mindfulness. And mindfulness is just about being in touch with who you are at that moment in time, being in touch with recognizing at that moment you're safe, you're at peace, you're serene. This is what mindfulness is. There's an exercise that we do when we do mindfulness exercise. Um, activity, we give everyone a grape and we ask them to close their eyes. And we ask them when they're eating the grape, don't chew it, just to bite the grape, just to savor what does it feel like when you take that first bite of the grape, what's going on in your mouth. And that's what mindfulness is about, is about being present in the here and now and just appreciating your surroundings. If there's something negative that's going on, Remove yourself from that situation and try to go somewhere where you can pull yourself together. Um, let yourself rest if you choose, if you're close to burnout. Your mental health comes first. All of these things wrapped together can be a healthy way of coping, but you have to decide that you're worth it and that you, these are some of the things that you want to do, need to do, and can do to take care of yourself. Next slide. Wanda, before you, I'm uh huh. Donna, you're muted. Okay. So... I can't. 
keeps remuting automatically. Sorry about that. So I'm watching the Q&A line that's uh-huh. coming in, and people are sharing some really wonderful things. Um, one is about keeping a gratitude journal yes. that um, has been offered. And someone else says you should keep a list of the best things that I can do for myself on a regular basis. And then following up on the conversation we had about the rain and water and Uh sea sounds, someone said there's also something called Insight Timer 1000, and it's free meditations and sleep music. So they wanted to offer um, all of that for this group. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, the next thing I just want to be I just will be presenting some information with regard to the wellness toolkit with regard to different things that you can do. Most of these are free. Now I have to admit I have not tried all of them. Some of them I have tried, but with regard to coping with stress and anxiety, you have a couple of um, sites that you can go to to check out. San Velo is clin- I'm not going to go through all of these clinically validated techniques for reducing stress and treating anxiety. And truly, when you Google any of these things, you will be amazed at how many free apps there are to help you to cope with some of these um, things that you may be going through. A PTSD coach, I think that is awesome. And it's almost like having um, a counselor. But again, I would encourage you that if you are experiencing any kind of stress or anxiety, If you need someone to talk to, absolutely reach out. Most of us are doing virtual sessions. I'm not sure how many people are actually doing face-to-face. But again, these are just some websites that you can go to to get additional support. Next slide. One after that. Oh, I'm sorry. Go back. I'm sorry. I didn't realize it was a continuation. Oh, okay. So it has the Family Coach Mothers and Babies Online course. I love the idea. I'm not familiar with it. So I hope if any of you check these out and there's a way to um, get feedback about how well this has gone for you, that would be great. <clears throat> Next one, please. Meditation and relaxation. Calm is what I was just talking about with regard to the one that I see advertised on TV. Headspace, I've heard about that as well. Stop, breathe, and think. I'm not familiar with that, but if it's free and it's for kids, please, please check into that. Again, there are a couple of things on here that I think would be helpful. I like the idea of a mindfulness coach, and right now, because of the pandemic, and if any of you are experiencing any kind of anxiety, because of the pandemic and you really need someone to talk to, give that a try. Next one, please. Maintaining physical fitness. Um, One of these I did look at, um, I don't remember which one it is, but again, these are just some um, sites that you can go to and some of these are free. And I think that again, if you Google aside from what I have up here, you may be able to find a ton of different activities activities that are out there that are free. And I do want to encourage people to take advantage of the free activities that are available because so many of us may be limited with our resources. And sometimes it's trial and error. Some programs may be great, some may not be. And again, take some advice from some friends that have tried some things to see what works from them. And if you've been using something that works, by all means, recommend that to family and friends as well. Next one, please. Okay, core um, power yoga. I know the one that I looked at was the Zumba dance concert videos. That's pretty active. So I think if you're really into dancing and you like Zumba, definitely you can check that out. And Peloton, I'm sure we've all seen the, um, the, um, the commercials about it as well. But again, this is offering a membership. That's a cost. So you want to take that in consideration if that's something you can afford to do. And Workout Today is a newsletter that offers free workout advice on different things that you can do at home. Next one, please. Mind, body, movement for restoration and relaxation. This is all about mindfulness. It's about, it's about using yoga. And again, it's to help 
all the, the whole being. So it's about the mind, the body, and the spirit. So these are different activities that you can take advantage of to help in all three of those areas. Next one, please. And I think, Connie, you're up. Thank you. Okay, so in thinking about how to utilize all of the just wonderful um, suggestions that one has just given us, I have a, a way of thinking about how you might want to begin the day. And so one of the things that I would suggest is that you, have, you try to have at least a semblance of a plan for each day, even if it means when you wake up, spending five minutes before you get out of bed and just thinking about what's on tap for that day and how you might be able to handle it. If you have a schedule, um, it's always a good idea to try to keep to routine and schedule even when things are as potentially chaotic as they have been. And again, uh, what I would say is that if you can't meet the schedule, forgive yourself for it and forgive your children if they can't quite do it and just have a pause and then get back to a schedule as soon as you can. For the bigger days, the holidays that are coming up, other special days are, as um, we talked about earlier, sort of central events for a family, have a bigger plan and have options for a plan B and a plan C. I know, I know that I am working on Thanksgiving Day and I am on call Thanksgiving night. So one of the things I know is that I'm going to probably Zoom with my daughters and their family on Thanksgiving evening. And then on Friday, I have off and that's when I'm going to cook a small turkey and I'm going to have a nice dinner with Paul. <laughs> and so those are the things that I, I and, and it pains me to spend a holiday at Thanksgiving like that because Thanksgiving was always a big deal and a big family gathering. So, but I'm adjusting and trying to finalize my plan. The other thing is, I like to do and I advise people to do is think of you can and you can think about this as a meditation but try to start off in a positive way and tell yourself whatever happens I'm going to be able to handle it and if the worst happens I have this thought that I could do or this thought that I could do so one of one of the things that 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 kind of um, brings up is that as I said before, some people aren't giving themselves credit for what they're actually accomplishing, for what they're actually able to do. And sometimes when you feel re-traumatized and you've had old trauma, you forget what got you through it. And so that reflection of, wait a second, I've had really bad feelings before. Maybe not this bad, but maybe I've had these bad feelings what helped me and what didn't? And try to do, do the things that helped you, that you knew helped you in the past. And if there were things that didn't work, I'll give you a good, a good example, like per, perhaps drinking too much, you know, um, or something like that, then make sure that you don't do that. Um, try, if you're not sleeping at all and, and you uh, think you're going to just on Netflix or something, you know, TV, try to say to yourself that you need to handle good sleep hygiene. And part of that is not exposing yourself to light and electronics before you try to sleep. So having those kind of notions of things that I know that worked before and things that I know that I can do may help you get through a day. Next slide, please. So at the end of the day, think about what went well and what you're grateful for. 
you know, um, I'm sure everybody's seen the the famous uh, movie, Christmas movie with Bing Crosby in it, and he sings the song, Count Your Blessings, Best Sheep. And I have used this really for many individuals that I've tried to help as well as myself. When you find yourself at night thinking about all the things that you didn't do right or that you feel that you should have done better or you start to have self-doubt or negative thoughts, try to push those thoughts out of your head and think about what happened that was good. And if you can't find what happened good that day, then try to think about all the things you're grateful for. And I'm really um, thanking the person in our audience who had the who had the suggestion for a gratitude journal, because that gives you something you can pick up and actually look at. And maybe you you can try doing that in terms of uh, writing down all the things, and you might find that you have a dozen pages of it, and you never thought of all of that before. So. Uh, the other thing I just want to say is that it's really, really important to forgive yourself and to forgive others because we're not going to do this perfectly. We're not going to do it perfectly every minute and every day. But we're going to keep doing our best and keep trying to move forward in the best way we can. So it's very important for that grace and uh, countenance that allows us to be kind and wanting to do the best we can. Celebrate everything you can that you can celebrate and um, keep planning. Next slide. So Wanda has given us a, I will say, it's like a Chinese menu in a lot of ways. There's like three from column A and six from column B, and there's there's many, many dozens of suggestions, and they are all excellent suggestions. But to make this work for you, what you need to do is think about the things that you like, things that you enjoy, and things that appeal to you. And then there are the basics, like the basics about taking care of your physical self. That's perhaps not something you can just opt in or out of. But it has to do with what, what makes me feel like I can be the best person I am every day. And I need to try to put into that backpack, that toolkit, so that I can be the best person I can be every day. And so think about, you know, what gives you the sense that you can handle things. One of the things that is hard, uh, having lost my parents some time ago, I have found myself thinking more than usual, gee, I really wish I could pick up the phone and talk to my dad. But since I can't do that, what I can do is I can share memories that I have of my dad. And I can think of what I would say to him if he was here right now. So think about the things make you feel like you can handle it and bring those to mind. And when you have a better day, think hard about what is better. So one of the things that I like to ask the people that come to see me for help, for follow-up, is and they'll say, oh, I'm feeling better. And I, my first question is all, always, well, what made, what's made it better? Because that's the key for you to have, have your element of the toolkit in order for you to keep growing and moving through the pain. And, or think about what made me different that day. Now, I know that if I don't get enough sleep, I'm, I'm starting out in the minus column. So one of the things that's really important for me, and I think that's important for most people, is making sure that you get a really good night's sleep. But this slide is meant to emphasize all the things that you can contemplate and review and try on uh, and figure out what makes you feel your best every day and what helps you if you feel like you're sliding into a place 
of feeling overwhelmed or feeling some of those negative emotions. So next slide, please. I like to end with this, this little poem I found, um, which I have used before. And it says, life is amazing, and then it's awful. And then it's amazing again. And in between the amazing and the awful, it's ordinary and mundane and routine. Breathe in the amazing. And I would say, and remember and hold on to it. Hold on through the awful. And if you can find somebody to hold on with you, even if it's virtual, do that too. And relax and inhale during the ordinary. I think that one of the things that's now is appreciating what seems like an ordinary moment in this extraordinary time. And just remember that it's living a heartbreaking, soul-healing, amazing, awful, ordinary life, and that it's breathtaking, beautiful. Because that's, to me, life is beautiful. And also what I love about this, and I want to say two sentences about the fact that there is always hope. The virus will end. There will be a point when we don't have to do all the things we're being strongly urged to do right now. I don't know when that is, but I do know that it will be over at some point. And I think about, okay, what is, what is on my bucket list for when this is all over? When, what, are, what do I want to do in the first day? days, the first week, the first month, and I know for sure that I want to be with my daughters and their family, and I want to hug them hours <laughs> because I'm a toucher, and I am one of these people that has missed touching, hugging, handshakes, all of that, and I can't wait to be able to touch again. So those are some of the thoughts that um, – I wanted to leave you with. We do have um, two slides here um, that have some resources. Next slide. There's Maryland 211. There's the Maryland chapter of NAMI. There's the Department of Health in Maryland, the Maryland Children Alliance. And there's links here that you can go to these sites. And um, also, very important, as we said this morning, the Maryland Network Against Domestic Violence, the Center for Disease Prevention, SAMHSA, U.S. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. There is a wealth of information there, in addition to disaster hotline, military and veterans hotline. There is also uh, a wealth of information about recovery and people who overcome tremendous challenges. And last but not least is the National Suicide Hotline. So I encourage you to have these available for yourself and others. And with that, I would like to open it up for our final reflection questions. Next slide. And um, we'd like to um, We'd, we'd love to hear your comments. So let me let me jump back in here and say a couple of things. First of all, an immense thank you to each of you who has led this conversation today, not only for the content, but also being so very personally transparent. I think it helps humanize um, all of this discussion and give us comfort, not only, as we've talked about before, that... I'm the only one who has these feelings, but to hear some of you say what you as experts have also been feeling and how you've, deal, how you've dealt with that is incredibly uh, impactful and powerful, and, and we're really grateful for it. This Not All Wounds series is intended to be a community conversation, so obviously we've heard from each of you as an expert, but i got to tell you we've gotten advice from many of the participants online, so I just want to share that. Wanda, you said something about the computer and putting it in a comfortable place and the dis-ease that it causes physically. Uh, there's a link that I'll share with you later on that, but there's a definition about computer ergonomics, which essentially just says put it in a place that makes you comfortable 
where you can reach. You, if you guys saw my rigging here, you'd be shocked. I've got the computer up on a box so it's higher and I'm not looking down. Um, and those are the kinds of things we want to do. And then certainly when you lift your elbows and have your wrists up, that helps as well. So we got advice there. And then there were several who wrote in when the uh, list of opportunities for fitness and other uh, things, mindfulness, et cetera, was shared, that there are so many free sites that you can find on YouTube, which is true. I do um, surf YouTube looking for all of that. And one particular mention is OBEOB -E -O -B Fitness. So our folks are writing in as well. Let me turn to some of the questions that I have seen. Um, and one is, we talk about keeping ourselves well and do what, doing what we want, but a question here is, how do we help people that we can tell are struggling? They may not want to say it outwardly, but we know them well enough and they're struggling. I don't want to be intrusive or overstep, and I don't want them to feel embarrassed, but I want to help. What do I do? I'd like to respond. I think that a way, a way that we can do that is if it's someone that we know well enough and feel comfortable, instead of saying, you look bad or you look tired, you could say, I'm experiencing you as somewhat stressed today. That means that it's you that's on the line. You're, you're, it's how you feel, not how they feel. And that sometimes helps people to be less defensive in, in saying and responding. I find that very helpful with my patients. That's great. Today. I also think that the whole idea of civility is another way of tapping into the ability to not to um, push, but just to check and touch base and say, are you okay, based on, especially if it's someone that you know, mm -hmm. this is what I'm noticing, and I'm not trying to be intrusive. I just want to make sure you're okay. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful. Um, I've had that quandary myself with some people that I know, especially young people, I must tell you, in their 20s who I see struggling a great deal. Uh, someone else wrote in and said, I hear all of these different – Connie, did you want to say something? I'm just going to get, offer some suggestions for if you see a stranger that is uh, obviously struggling. I think – um, one, I think Wanda, you said something. It was you who said something that you know you can see if someone is smiling with their eyes. So even with um, um, having the masks on, I was I was in a store and this um, cashier was obviously very overwhelmed and apologizing as if there was going to be. She was fearful that. I would be angry. I wasn't, she wasn't doing things fast enough. And I looked at her and I made very good eye contact and I said, I said, listen, this is not what I'm upset about. Take your time. You know, I appreciate what you're doing. And so that, that small gesture of kindness and that human connection without going into, you know, five reasons why she her day was perhaps not good was very reassuring. She really thanked me and said, Well it's been nice waiting on you. <laughs> so I was I just want to emphasize that you can you can communicate human kindness to anyone who looks stressed without taking on what they're stressed about and and make them feel like they're they're glad to have had the interaction with you. That is great. That is great. So there's a question here that says, we hear so many terms, and often they're used interchangeably. I feel like we're going to go to Psych 101 in a moment, but um, what's the difference? What's stress versus anxiety, nervousness, fear, concern, and feeling overwhelmed? Or are they all the same thing? I guess I'd like to... Go ahead, Connie. Go ahead. Then I well, what I was going to say is that stress is a recognizable event that would cause any person to be off key or off kilter. Anxiety is the fear or the feeling of not being able to deal with something that you don't know what's going to happen. And fear has to do with something that is specific. 
so that, you know, I am afraid of, I'm afraid of having a motor vehicle accident. So I make sure I obey all the traffic signals and I make sure that I'm not a aggressive, reckless driver. I can hear the COVID virus and take all the necessary precautions. I can hear um, maybe other people, so I avoid them. <laughs> but fear is something that is uh, that you know what it is that is bothering you, um, and that's different than stress, which is usually an event that has would be recognizable by anyone as being something that was difficult to deal with, if that helps. That's great. Any other comments that any of you would like to make on that? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So here's a question that says, since the start of this, back to our sleeping or not sleeping through the night, since the start of the pandemic, I sometimes wake up in the middle of the night and then I can't fall back asleep. Should I continue to lay there or get up and just start my day? I'll respond. First of all, it's, it's, it's important to recognize that if we can get seven to eight hours of sleep per 24, that's, that's great. But you have to consider if you nap during the day that you might wake up in the middle of the night. So that's number one. Number two, sometimes we wake up in the middle of the night not because of stress of, of circumstances like the COVID or, or politics. Sometimes it's because we didn't take in adequate calories during supper. So here's a trick you can do, then this will separate what, what it is. So if you're waking up between two and four, that might be because your, your um, blood sugar has bottomed out, your, your insulin has bottomed out. You can keep, I don't know how many people can see, you probably can't see me, little pack of something dry. I like Velveeta crackers. Keep it on your nightstand, close enough to your bed. You don't have to turn on the light to open the package. And these crackers come in four in a pack, and they have protein in them. If I'm having a sleepless night between the hours of two and four, if I open this and eat two of these, usually within 10 minutes I'm back to sleep because my blood sugar goes back to where it's supposed to be. So if you eat supper too early or you don't take in adequate nutrition, you may be waking up because your body is saying, I need more calories to get us through the night successfully. So you have to separate that then out. That was really so I'd like to address the part of that question where the person's asking, should I get up and start my day? Well, I don't think it would be, let's just say, a wise day at 2 or 3 a.m. And, the, the, you know, there are kind of two schools of thought about this. One was that get up, spend some energy, maybe, maybe make yourself tired, and then try going back to bed. But that's not going to work if you're supposed to be getting up to work for, you know, like at 6 a.m. or something. So the other school of thought, which I – uh, more, more adhere to is that you should stay in bed and try to rest and do some of the things that I suggested about turning your mind to a different channel or uh, trying some thought stopping if you're then overwhelmed with negative thoughts and see if that helps. The other thing to keep in mind is how often is that happening? Is that happening three or four nights a week, almost every night? If that's the case, then maybe you need something uh, different and you might need to con consult with someone about what seems like insomnia. If it just happened occasionally, I, I, I wouldn't worry about it as much. I hope that answer helps you. That was great. That was great. Here's a question that goes back to the issue of loss, which we spoke about a great deal this morning, and what to do about it. And it says, it seems like every time I plan something to look forward to, and I think this is especially important with the holidays coming up as we've discussed, it gets canceled. Is it best to keep planning or stop planning until COVID is over 
to avoid the repeated disappointment. Shall I take it? I would say, first of all, the use of words like every time, always, never, sometimes paints us into a, a very small space. And so right now, because of COVID, things maybe are being canceled or postponed or, or held in a different format. But if you can avoid thinking about it as this always happens to me and this is horrible and I can't stand it much longer and turn it into an opportunity. So, so this got canceled today. That leaves me an extra hour or two hours to do something for myself or for my family. And I think you would maybe view it not as so much a loss as an opportunity. And the other thing that I would add to is, can you think of something else that you can do instead of? So something that maybe you can replace it with that maybe not be as magnanimous as you would want it. So that way you don't feel that you're really losing something. But I like what you said, Deborah. It's not all or nothing. So sometimes it's how we're looking at things and how we cope with it. Good point. Sure. That's really great. There's a comment here about, thank you for the term hugs for hours. I'm going to do that when this ends. Um, those seem to be all of the questions that we have. Let's go to the next slide, if you don't mind, please. So I mentioned in the beginning that this entire conversation is available to everyone, whether you were here today or not, and it should be available in about 48 hours. If you go to our website, alms.org slash not all wounds, again, this is part of our not all wounds mental health uh, series, you'll be able to see this session. As well, you can look at all the prior sessions. We had three related solely to COVID, and both Connie and Wanda participated in those. One about you know, what, what should I expect? These were in April on a Thursday, Tuesday, and a Thursday in, in um, quick succession. What do I expect about COVID? What are the anxieties, the stresses, the fears that I already feel coming up, and what do I do about that? How do I help my family, most especially children? And we've had some conversation here today that we can't forget children and the anxiety that they have of their own or of um, what they pick up from others. And I can tell you I'm I know a little nine-year-old gentleman who knew his mom needed to be tested and that he was going to be tested, and he, you know, melted into tears because he thought he was going to die. He hears the, hears the news, and it took some comforting, of course. And then about um, isolation. Certainly, we know there are many of us who live alone, um, elders, people who are in nursing homes or assisted living who are by themselves who are feeling that. So you can see all of those. As well, when June rolled around and we were dealing with the issues of social unrest, racial unrest, et cetera, we did two sessions that were very interactive, focused on those issues and mental health and well-being with the underlay or overlay, if you will, of COVID. So there are multiple sessions up there that are available for anyone um, to see. What I would like to do as we end is just uh, – Again, say thank you so much to the panelists, but read a couple of the comments that have come in. One says, this has been very helpful. I learned so many different ways to deal with the emotions I go through during this very trying time. And then another one says, thanks to these amazing panelists, with an exclamation point, regardless of when this pandemic ends, we now have more in our toolkit to remain hopeful, mindful, and grateful. So once again, the slides will be available um, shortly, and you can watch any or all of these uh, over again, should you like. And thank you all. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, audience, uh, for your participation today. This has been great. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending today's session. You may now disconnect your lines and have a wonderful day.